Good afternoon, everyone. I want to start on time because we have a lengthy agenda today. My name is Lene Palmasano, and I'm the chair of Committee of the Whole. I'm going to call to order this regular meeting for Tuesday, April 26th, and ask the clerk to please call the roll and verify the presence of a quorum. Councilmember Payne. Present. Councilmember Wansley Warlaba. Oh, yeah. Present. Councilmember Rainville. Present. Councilmember Vita. Present. Councilmember Ellison. Here. Councilmember Osman. Present. <clears throat> Councilmember Goodman. Present. President Jenkins. Present. Councilmember Chugtai is absent. Councilmember Kosky. Present. Councilmember Johnson is present, or excuse me, is absent. <laughs> um, Vice Chair Chavez. Present. And Chair Palmasano. Present. That's 11 members present. Thank you. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. Colleagues, um, you will have just received a, a Teams chat, and that is how we will manage the queue, the speaker's queue for today. Uh, you'll have just seen that from Ken Daler. Uh, we have four items on our agenda today, in addition to our reports of committees that have met this cycle and a couple of announcements at the end. So I will begin with a report relating to the city and county's joint strategy for responding to homelessness in the city of Minneapolis. We have several people here involved in today's presentation, but I will invite Director Andrea Brennan to kick us off. Welcome, Director. Um, council members, I'm Andrea Brennan, Director of Community Planning and Economic Development, and I have the pleasure of kicking off this presentation um, for you today. We have fundamentally reshaped our homelessness response system in the city in the last couple of years. The city has a formal relationship uh, or partnership with the county through the establishment of the um, city, county, office, and homelessness and through a memorandum of understanding between the city and the county that details this partnership. The city and the county team members, we collaborate and work together on a daily basis. The city and the county, we also collaborate with others, including state and federal government and the many, many community and um, community organizations and partners. It takes all partnerships in this work. We have um, also collaborated, you'll hear today, the collaboration um, across the enterprise, so departments throughout the city, um, especially as it relates to uh, serving households who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Our goal today is to give you a high-level um, understanding of the city-county strategy to, um, to uh, respond to, address, and, and prevent homelessness. The, um, uh, you, we will share data on homelessness, we'll highlight um, success that, that we've had, we'll highlight areas where we still face significant challenges, we'll talk about um, an increase in investments that we've made in the last couple of years and talk about where we think we are positioned to see some future success. Um, you will hear uh, from David Hewitt, who directs the Hennepin County's Office of Housing Stability, Katie Topinka, CPED's uh, Manager of Policy, Research, and Outreach, uh, Saray, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Saray Garnett Huchuli, our Director of Regulatory Services, Heidi Ritchie, our Interim um, Health Commissioner, and Elfric Port, our Director of uh, um, Housing Policy and Development. Our first um, presenter here is David Hewitt. I will hand it over to him. Um, but first, I would just um, ask, we have a lot of material here to cover. Um, it's not comprehensive. If, if it was totally comprehensive, we'd be here all day. Um, but we are trying to fit a lot of information into a relatively short period of time. So if it, if it pleases um, Madam Chair and the, and the council members, if we could try to get through um, most of this presentation and then all of us will be available to stand for questions at the end. Will do. Welcome, Mr. Hewitt. We're glad you're with us today. Thank you, Madam Chair, council members. Uh, as you've heard, my name is David Hewitt. I'm the Director of Housing Stability at Hennepin County. Uh, to the point about a lot of material, what I'm going to give you is kind of a concise version of two three-hour briefings we gave to the Board of Commissioners at the county last year. So 
Uh, I've tried to get through a lot of material here. Uh, I am going to cover who experiences homelessness in our community, the role of Hennepin County, recent trajectory, and our current strategy. I'm also my own tech support, so bear with me here. Uh, I'm going to start off with who experiences homelessness and some fundamentals here. When we think about homelessness, we often think about the most visible high-profile cases, and we might think about factors such as mental health and chemical dependency. In our most recent point in time survey, 22% uh, of the people we spoke to identified mental health as a challenge that they experienced, and 12% of those experiencing homelessness identified chemical dependency as a challenge they experienced. But 95% of people experiencing homelessness had one, and one thing only in common, which is that they were all in the lowest income bracket uh, that we estimate in housing policy terms, which is below 30% of the area median income, or about 21,000 for an individual, about 30,000 for a family of three, as the uppermost of where they were at in terms of income. So everyone comes from this lowest income group, and I've got a couple of slides here which speak to why that is. There are an estimated 74,000 households in Hennepin County in that income bracket, and only 14,000 units of housing that are affordable to them, that are subsidized to be affordable to them. So we have a 60,000 gap. What that means is, as you see on this slide, this group in the very lowest income bracket already are also the group that are paying the largest proportion of their already too low income towards the cost of housing. That puts them at extreme risk for the smallest economic shock tipping them into homelessness. Uh, it is sometimes said that people might be two to three paychecks away from homelessness. Uh, I would question that across the board. What I would say when we get into this group is we are talking one car breakdown, one kid getting sick away from homelessness. So this is uh, fundamentally who is impacted. I'm going to say one more thing about who experiences homelessness, which is just to call out that over and above already disproportionate rates of poverty, it is our communities of color that are impacted by homelessness. And I attribute this to two primary reasons. The first I will call the inequity pile-up, uh, that on top of those already disproportionate rates of poverty, the higher rates of interaction with the criminal justice system, the lower outcomes in employment, education, these multiply and compound the barriers to housing stability uh, that people of color in our community face. The second I will call network impoverishment. Uh, this is the uh, communities that have been prevented from developing intergenerational wealth. What that means is that when that individual faces the economic shock, those who would step in to help are likely themselves close to crisis as well and can be tipped over rather than able to assist. So this is the context in which we work. I will turn now to Hennepin County's work. Uh, there's a few different ways I could describe this. The first one is in dollars. Uh, we estimate that we leverage approximately $146 million each year into the community, primarily in state and federal funds, uh, across the continuum of housing from extremely low income to moderate income, and a, and a range of services within that. We focus the vast majority of that effort, for the reasons that I just explained, at that extremely low income level. Uh, for instance, the single largest source of funding that comes into our community is known as state housing support, formerly known, better known as GRH. That was about $80 million that came into our community last year to pay for people's rent, to pay their room and board, and to pay support services for people who are formerly homeless. One other thing I will note on this slide, because it's a motif I will return to throughout, uh, are these two arrows, entering homelessness, exiting homelessness. New people presented for homeless services yesterday just as they did the day before and the day before that. And people exit homelessness every day as well. The balance of these two forces is what dictates the trajectory our community is on, and I will come back to that point. With regards to what does 146 million a year buy, you just have a very high level couple of figures here. Essentially, it provides some level of assistance to more than 20,000 households a year. That can be in the form of one-time financial assistance, or it can be in the form of what I've put in here as quotation marks, beds. There are an estimated 11,000 beds across the various forms of supportive housing and including emergency shelter in our community. The single largest uh, type is permanent supportive housing, which we estimate more than 7,500 units. And that's our most effective long-term uh, response to, uh, to homelessness. Take a quick drink of water. This is, I'm going to talk about this as the underpinning of our strategy. So when we think about how we're going to use these dollars and the interventions that we're going to support, 
Our strategy is to make homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. We want to prevent homelessness wherever it occurs to bring down that first arrow of the number of people entering homelessness. Underneath the shelter and the street outreach boxes here, you will see brief. Our priority whenever encountering somebody experiencing homelessness is to get them out of homelessness as quickly as possible. That second arrow, how many people are exiting homelessness. And then of course it has to be sustainable. We need to make sure that people aren't cycling back through, uh, that it is non-recurring. I'm not expecting you to be able to read every detail on this, but we wanted to give you a bit of a feel for what the structure of my area in Hennepin County looks like, and this is our org chart, and you will see that it is structured around those three goals of make homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. So the, the team in orange here uh, focus on preventing evictions, preventing new homelessness cases. They are currently pumping out about one and a half to two million dollars a month in federal emergency rental assistance. They are in housing court every single calendar alongside our lawyers to provide services to low-income renters, and they are providing funding to nonprofits in our community to do targeted case management work with at-risk households. The team in blue is the team that works directly with folks who are already experiencing homelessness. This is the piece that we also refer to as the Office to End Homelessness. This is the team that oversees all of the funding that goes to shelters and emergency response. It's our coordinated entry team. And the three big boxes along the bottom did not exist before the pandemic. Each one of those is doing direct one-to-one -one casework with people who are currently homeless to get them into housing. And I will come back to that. The team in green oversee the funds that flow to those beds in our community, those supportive housing units. That's actually where most of the money flows through, but we don't have a direct provision role. Uh, we're leveraging funds for our community. I will now turn to recent trajectory. Uh, and I'm gonna rely a little bit here on the federal point in time count data. Uh, I will say up front that all data is flawed, but some of it is useful, I think, is a mantra I come back to. Uh, the federal point in time count data is a one night count carried out in January of everyone experiencing homelessness by HUD definitions in our community. I would never hold it up as the one absolute truth. Uh, I think, you know, just the fact that numbers change from day to day is problematic. The fact that it's in January, not July. There are other things that can be used to question it. But what it is helpful for is it's a broadly the same methodology used over time and across the country. So it does allow us to look at trajectory and comparison. Uh, I will highlight two things here. One is that this is rounded from the 2020 count. In four of our last five pit counts up to 2020, the number was basically the same. It was between 3,000 and 3,100. Now, they weren't the same people necessarily, but if you're coming back 12 months later and you're getting the same count, what that tells you is those two arrows, those two forces are in stasis, that for everybody that is exiting homelessness, somebody else is coming in and taking their place. So that's where we've been. The other thing I'll just highlight here, is Hennepin County is the geography that we look at, but if we zero in on Minneapolis, the shelters and transitional housing programs included here uh, are geocoded, and we know that 85 to 90% are in the city of Minneapolis. This unsheltered count has been predominantly focused on the city of Minneapolis, so I would posit that a similar proportion should be thought of as, as here in the city of Minneapolis. I wanted to pull out some comparisons. 2020, we have census data and point in time data for communities across the country. Uh, I've pulled out a few here. It will come as a surprise to no one that as you head west, uh, the numbers get a lot higher. So based on point in time count data in Hennepin County, about one in 400 people are experiencing homelessness and about one in 2,000 are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. If we head to Seattle and Portland, the rates of homelessness double and the rates of unsheltered homelessness multiply five times. If we go to Oakland, we're getting closer to eight times the number of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness. And I have left off the big three here, San Jose, LA, San Francisco, where you're getting up to 10, 12 times the rate of unsheltered homelessness. This for me is the cautionary tale. It's where we need to make sure we are not going as a community. I've also included here a couple of other comparisons. Boston, like New York, actually has very, very low rates of unsheltered homelessness, but very high rates of people living in shelter. Uh, also undesirable in its own way. I've included Milwaukee, Salt Lake could also have played this role uh, to show that there are communities that are outperforming us on both measures, which gives us something to aspire to. Sticking within Hennepin, within Minneapolis for a second, that static 3,000 to 3,100 number hides some pretty significant movement below the surface. 
From 2014 to 2019, we saw a 50% reduction in families with children experiencing homelessness in our community. 2014, we had about 1,500 families use shelter. That dropped to 800 in 2019. Didn't happen by accident, it happened because we invested in prevention and the Stable Home, Stable Schools partnership is a big part of that. We invested in employment services and we targeted uh, supportive housing to the most in need families through a coordinated entry system. You'll see here an even steeper decline in the last two years which we attribute to the widespread availability of federal emergency rental assistance and the eviction moratorium. So we have to be concerned as a community about what happens as those things move away and the potential for hundreds more children to be impacted by homelessness once more. Now, if the overall number was staying the same, but the families were coming down, something else was offsetting it. Single adults experiencing homelessness has been increasing throughout this period, and that has been driving an increase in unsheltered homelessness that you see here. And this is of the greatest concern for us, because this is where we have the greatest danger from fire, infectious disease, violence, and exploitation of people experiencing homelessness. This slide just emphasizes the point that what we see in that is that it's single adults driving that increase. Even so, within this period, uh, we've been working as part of a national movement called Built for Zero to really focus on and learn lessons from work around ending veteran homelessness and ending chronic homelessness. And I've had some significant successes here. The slide you see in front of you here focuses on chronic homelessness. This is people who are long-term homeless and have a disability. And what you see is since we started these targeted efforts in July of 2017, more than 1,000 people have been moved into housing with a 94% retention rate, not returning to homelessness. So these are folks with long experience of homelessness with a lot of barriers, but being successful in housing. And when you look at that average length of time homeless, if we add up all of these people and their experience of homelessness, there is more than 3,500 years of experience of homelessness in this group and they are, have been housed, and the vast majority are successful in housing. So we have seen within some subgroups, at least, some real success and things we can build on. So that's kind of where we were pre-pandemic, some things to be very concerned about around unsheltered homelessness, some areas of progress, particularly around families, and then, of course, the world turned upside down. I'm gonna, I think I have a little animation here, so I'm going to walk you through what each of these numbers means. Hennepin County was, we believe, the second community in the entire country to begin moving people who were senior and at highest medical risk from COVID into non-congregate shelter in hotels. It started on March 17th. It was the first thing we did on declaring the state of emergency. And in total, we sheltered 1,137 people in that category. A year ago, there were 540 people in those hotels at an annual cost of approximately $16.5 million. The number today of people who are senior, medically high risk in these hotel shelters is zero. And this was a very deliberate end product of a strategy where we knew we couldn't sit in this crisis response indefinitely. We needed to have longer term solutions. And what we did was we built out, and you'll remember from the org chart, those boxes, a team of housing-focused case managers so that every single one of those individuals had a person dedicated to them whose focus as a matter of urgency and priority was to get them into permanent housing. And they moved 464 people into permanent housing with a 97% retention rate. So that has brought us to where we are today in that crisis response. And at the same time, as Andrea was saying, we have been working city and county alongside each other to transform the broader homeless response system and further those strategic goals around making homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. To minimize people coming in, as I say, we've been pumping out that emergency financial assistance. We have been providing Hennepin County Adult Representation Service lawyers to low-income renters at Housing Court, and members of my team have sat alongside them to make sure they're getting connected to everything they need. And we've been getting more and more money to nonprofits to do that community-based work to prevent homelessness. And Next year, there's a new local homeless prevention aid that will come out from the state for families in our community uh, at a level of, we estimate as much as $5 million a year that we'll be using to further that work. And on the other side of the ledger, we have invested in, partnered to help create a Vivo Village, the American Indian Community Development Corporation, Homeward Bound, the new women's shelter at 2400 Stevens. Those have already sheltered hundreds of people and moved more than 100 people into permanent housing, many more into treatment and other settings. 
Even so, the majority of people on any given night are going to be served in the existing shelters, so they needed to be better. They needed to be fit for purpose. We needed to move away from them being overcrowded and overnight only. So we've invested in making the shelters 24-7, improving the physical facilities, bringing the numbers down, bringing the staffing levels up. And we've done so in partnership with the Street Voices of Change, an advocacy group of people who have experienced or are experiencing homelessness, and in alignment with their shelter bill of rights. Uh, if I was going to walk over to the screen, if I could leave that high, and circle anything on here, again, it's going to be that housing-focused case management. I believe in my bones that is the thing we are doing differently now that is going to have the biggest impact in the long run. As well as achieving those 464 moves into permanent housing from the hotels, uh, we kind of took that as a proof of concept, and as the hotel work started winding down at the end of last year, we started rolling that out so they could work with anyone in any unsheltered or sheltered setting. And as of this very morning, so I checked it this morning, it had gone up by another one, they have moved 127 additional people into permanent housing, with more than half coming directly from unsheltered settings and from the streets. We also need more places for people to go, of course. Supportive housing, we are very excited that the Catholic Charities Endeavours project will open this summer. 70 additional new units of supportive housing for people experiencing homelessness will be coming directly out of homelessness and moving in there as that lease is up. And single room occupancy. Going back to my very first slide, if what everyone has in common is a really low income, we need deeply affordable options for people to live in so they're not living in shelter or on the streets for want of anything affordable. And Hennepin County at this point has purchased four buildings. We've just got approval to purchase two more that will create more than 200 units of single room occupancy housing in our community. How we are doing it is with federal stimulus dollars, of course. Uh, the county has committed 46 million towards housing from our American Rescue Plan funds, and almost the same amount again on those homelessness measures to keep things like a Vivo Village, Homeward Bound, 24 seven shelters going throughout the federal stimulus period, and we believe we cannot go backwards. That amounts to almost 40% of our total American Rescue Plan funds have gone to housing and homelessness. And here is what all of this is adding up to. Uh, I often kind of reflect that pretty much any individual program on its own terms will, re will report success. And you know, I worked for a spell in international development, this was a challenge there. You have individual programs that are doing great work, but what is happening across the community as a whole and are you seeing the benefit it, of it all add up? Uh, this slide takes a dashboard that HUD Technical Assistance developed for us to track the community-wide progress in moving people into permanent housing. The blue line is the baseline pre-pandemic period. The orange line starts October 2020 when the investments we were making were just starting. And what we have seen every single month since is we are moving people out of homelessness and into permanent housing at one and a half times the rate we were pre-pandemic. And every indication, especially with those new housing projects coming online, suggests that that will continue and indeed accelerate as long as we keep this focus and these efforts going. This just humanizes that. Uh, the very last hotel shelter that uh, Hennepin closed will convert to deeply affordable housing and reopen later this year was the Metro, which some of you may know, in South Minneapolis. Uh, when we moved in, we painted on the wall this mural. And every time an individual moved out and into their own permanent housing, they added a flower to the mural with their name or initials. So every flower you see on this mural represents an individual who'd been homeless, often long-term homeless, the senior had other medical fragilities moving into permanent housing uh, and, and making that transition in life. All right, that's me finished. But just to finish, this is where we have been. In stasis, far too many people on the streets, far too many people in shelter. This is where we could still go. This is my West Coast scenario. Uh, where if the numbers exiting homelessness slow down and the numbers entering homelessness increase, we actually start seeing year-on-year -year growth. In this diagram, I have kind of, for simplicity's sake, uh, assumed the proportions remain the same. That's not a safe assumption. I'd actually say it's the wrong assumption. What I would speculate is if we were in this scenario, that unsheltered number is going to grow faster than the sheltered number because you cannot keep pace with adding shelter and as shelters become overcrowded, more people opt out because of the negative experiences that come with that. So this should be of huge concern to us, the possibility that more and more people would be at risk from 
via infectious disease, violence and exploitation while experiencing homelessness in our community if we were on this path. But I don't think it's a given that we are on that path. Uh, I think there is an alternative scenario, which I think is the investments we are making and the strategy we are following, which is to increase the pace at which people exit homelessness, decrease the pace at which they come in, and actually bring down those numbers year, year on year. So there are fewer people on the streets, fewer people in danger and encampments, fewer people in shelters, so the shelters themselves can do a better job. Uh, this won't happen overnight, but it also won't happen by accident. Uh, so we need that intentionality and that focus. Uh, I can share, just in concluding, that we have our provisional numbers for the 2022 point in time count. We weren't able to do a 2021 one because of the pandemic, obviously, uh, but we did this year. We have provisional numbers that we are getting ready to submit to HUD. They are subject to change, uh, but what we are looking at is an overall number of 2,700 and an unsheltered number in the region of 490. Now, to state the obvious, well, I, all the same caveats that I had for the point in time count earlier, plus that is 2,700 people too many, that is 490 people too many, but it does represent a decrease of 12% overall and 24% in the unsheltered count, which kind of lines up with what we've been seeing in those exits to permanent housing and the impact of that strategy. So this is the path I believe we are on with our investments and we can continue to be on, making homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. That is the end of my presentation. I'm delighted to answer further questions at the end, but I believe I'm handing to Katie to Pinker right now. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Topinka. Thank you, and thank you, David, for being here um, to, to give us that overview. Um, I'm giving a very short presentation here, but just to introduce a little bit more about what role does the city play. So David did a really good job talking about the overall system, how we partner together, and I just want to highlight for all of you some of the specific things the city has been doing over the last couple of years. Um, I'm going to focus on some recent investments in the homelessness response system and also talk about our role in making policy changes when we see there's a need to change our policy to be able to respond to the needs we're seeing in the community. Um, and then you'll hear from some of uh, my other colleagues uh, here at the city. Um, so uh, David noted that we've uh, collectively made pretty significant investments during the pandemic and also committed to making investments to improve the system moving forward. The city's share of these investments is listed here. We have awarded $17 million in funds to projects already. Those include improvements to the shelter system, uh, additional funding for homeless street outreach services, which is something that the city has long funded. Um, we fund uh, uh, community organizations to provide outreach to people who are in uh, places unfit for human habitation. They provide services to get those folks connected to shelters, to housing, and to other services that they may need. And we increase those investments um, during the pandemic. We've also funded rapid rehousing, again, to try to get people out of um, homelessness and into housing quickly. Um, the council approved $5 million in shelter capital funds at your last uh, council meeting. Um, and those are part of $38 million in American Rescue Plan Act phase one funds that the city has committed to housing and homelessness response. These are unprecedented investments that as Director Brennan pointed out, have fundamentally changed the system over the last couple of years. And we are committed to, to making sure these changes stay in place. So now I'm just gonna highlight a couple of these projects. David already mentioned some of them. One is the Endeavors Project or Catholic Chari Charities at Elliott Park. This is opening uh, it next month. Um, it includes permanent housing and a medical respite shelter. There will also be a Hennepin County Health for, Healthcare for the Homeless Clinic on site. And this is a really important project because it will uh, provide a resource for people who are being discharged from hospitals who are experiencing homelessness to go to a medical respite shelter, get additional care and build skills to, to um, successfully transition out of that situation rather than being discharged into homelessness or in discharged under the street. Um, Endeavors also includes 173 deeply affordable apartments for veterans, elderly, medically frail, frail and people experiencing chronic homelessness. The city invested $2 million in the medical respite shelter portion of this project and $3.9 million from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund for the permanent housing. And this building is really a resource for the community and not just, not just a housing site. Um, 
the next project I wanted to highlight that just came online within the last um, year and a half is Avivo Village. This is a project that came to the city and the county and funders from community. So this wasn't, um, wasn't something we came up with, but it was something we were really excited to be able to support because it gets at a lot of the barriers that people with lived experience of homelessness have identified as reasons they may decide not to go into shelter. So Avivo Village has individual units, it has storage, it allows pets, it's low barrier. Referrals come directly from street outreach teams for people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness and they are referred into Avivo Village. Um, we also changed some policy to make this happen, which I'll get into in a moment, but I just wanna highlight too that not only did the city, has the city provided um, $3.7 million toward this project in funding, but our zoning and planning teams um, moved mountains to, to make this happen in a short period of time. And that's another role that the city plays in responding to, to um, people experiencing homelessness in our community. 73 people have already moved out of Avivo Village and into permanent housing. Um, and again, I just wanna emphasize that this was really a community-led project that the city, county, and state, and, and philanthropic partners were happy to help come in and, and make happen. We were also able to fund in 2020 Homeward Bound. This is another shelter that was identified by people experiencing homelessness as a need that we were missing in our system. And now, now we have it. And that's a culturally specific shelter for Native Americans. We do know that um, unfortunately, uh, Native American community members experience unsheltered homelessness at a disproportionate rate compared to um, compared to others experiencing homelessness. And um, so our trusted uh, partner, American Indian Community Development Corporation, came forward with a proposal to build a culturally specific shelter and have uh, culturally specific services for people in the Native American community who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. The city invested $1.72 million in this project. It's been open since December of 2020. They've served 488 people. Um, 158 people have moved out of that um, facility into permanent housing, into transitional housing, or into um, a setting like treatment. And then um, David already mentioned the women's shelter that the city helped to fund. It's now in its permanent location at 2400 Stevens. Uh, as I already said, you recently improved additional shelter capital improvements that are listed here. And I just wanna reiterate, um, David's earlier point that these investments are, are changing the shelter system so that they're open 24 seven, there's case management in every shelter, there's storage, there's lower barriers. It's really, this is part of the strategy of trying to have not only greater number of shelter beds available, but better quality shelter. And lastly, um, an important role the city plays in the homelessness response system is changing policy when there is a policy that's, that's making something difficult um, to happen. And so one of the things that we realized when we were working on both Homeward Bound and Vivo Village is that there were some restrictions in the zoning code that were limiting how many um, beds there could be in the shelters or where they could be located. And so the council acted in uh, 2020 and amended the code so that um, shelters could be located in industrial districts, allowed for shelters with a higher number of beds. And this really built on work that the council had done back in 2015 that allowed shelters in um, almost every part of the city, which is um, a really important policy. Um, so this is just an example of the way when we are identifying needs and the community is identifying needs, we can respond to them with policy changes to, um, to improve the overall homelessness response system. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Director Garnett Huhuli and Interim Commissioner uh, Heidi Ritchie to talk a little bit more about the city's response to unsheltered homelessness. Thank you. Welcome, Director Garnett Huchuli. So as you know, um, the city, we talked about at the county, what's going on, and then at the city, all of the things that we've done with shelter. And now it falls to the gap when people are unsheltered. And so as you have stated, Katie stated, we've moved this into regulatory for uh, services for a couple of reasons. One is, I don't know if you know that we have a spectrum of how people, when we are responsible for housing, the health and safety of housing and that land and that structure. 
And so we also have housing liaisons that support folks who are in rental property and also property owners. Now we have a team that has moved from CPET and health, now in a coordinated effort under regulatory service. And this allows us to be proactive and actually come together. And part of that agreement or that decision is that we actually had a manager to manage the work, to get ahead of the work, to broadly look at the system and find the gaps and plan, and that person was just moved into our department last Monday, as well as those other coordinators. And this is a big deal because we are truly trying to step back and have a systematic approach, really focusing people first, but also looking at long-term solutions. And some of the things that we've done in this last week were developed intake forms that weren't really done. In a way, we really wanna base our decisions on data. We wanna know where these locations are. We wanna understand the folks at these properties. What is the why? Why do we find ourselves in this situation? We're taking this all together and we're working with the county very closely. We have a person dedicated to working with the county, dedicated to supporting our staff that are out there working with folks. And we really want to understand what are the impacts of these uh, when folks are unsheltered. And we wanna take that back and really take a step back and work with our partners, work with health, work with CPED from a policy perspective and look at and then nest into Hennepin counties about making this not occurring again. Things are happening and we wanna just make sure that we understand the gaps and where those system failures are. I will say that we've taken this only a week under my regulatory services and I wanna acknowledge that in this last year since the homeless in, uh, coordinators were brought into the city, it's only been a year. And it's been challenging, we've done this in a pandemic and those staff have been out there touching people and trying to understand. And so what we're trying to do is really nest into what the county is doing, understanding that this is our responsibility as a city as well. We're not taking over the county's job, but we're adding to it and supporting it this way. They're doing it this and we're doing this way. We're very much mir mirroring how they are approaching, um, approaching the situation. And then, so I'd like to uh, turn it over to Interim Commissioner Richie, because she focused on the health component of this. Because I will say, this is a holistic approach. Not one department is responsible for this. We are all working together. And so with CPEP from a policy and also with the health department, I'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon, Chair and Council members. Um, so I'm Heidi Ritchie, Interim Health Commissioner at the Health Department. Um, like uh, Director Garnett Hutuli said, we are transitioning and have almost finished transitioning the two response coordinators that were in the health department over to regular service, regulatory services. We also took some of our CDC grant money and we repurposed a position, C CDC COVID grant money specifically, and repurposed our position that was doing some vaccine and immunization work into this effort in street outreach as well. And that person is also going to be going over to regular service, regulatory services. So we are expanding our ability to reach out. In the health department, we take a primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, and that's what we really wanna get back to focus on. And so we've got the immediate response and outreach um, in the uh, reg services, but in the health department, we wanna look at how can we look at these primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention in order to make sure that we can prevent people from, being come, from becoming homeless in the first place. So that's the kind of human resource piece of it that we're trying to focus on to make sure that people are safe in their homes, they get adequate medical care, they have access to that medical care. We're also dealing with some of the people that are in unsheltered situations where we have to go to them with some of these resources like vaccines, like education and things like that. And we wanna make sure that in everything we do, it's human centered, it's promoting dignity, and we remember that these are people first. Thank you. Alfred. Welcome, Mr. Port. Good afternoon. Thanks, um, Chair, members of the, um, the committee. I am Elfric Port. I'm the Director of Housing at the City of Minneapolis in the Department of Community Planning and Economic Development. These, most of what you've heard today talks about collaboration. And part of what my presentation is going to um, um, foster, 
talk about is going to be um, building off of that from an investment perspective. This is the, the, the mayor's um, budget in, the, in his first term represented um, allocations that increased funding to affordable housing in the tens of millions of dollars. The city's investment is leveraged with other resources. So our dollars are one, one dollar of city's investment is about $15 of, of non-city city resources. Most of the homeless units produced include state bonding and MPHA um, sources. As a result of the increase in resources, you would see in this slide, you would see that we've increased the number of 30% um, AMI units um, over the, over the um, last three years. And the, if you look at the blue um, section, those are the ones that um, cater to the 30% um, AMI um, units. This year, earlier this year, you all approved um, $16.8 million in, in housing for affordable, for affordable housing. 40% of those units, approximately 40% of those units were focused on catering to households at or below 30% AMI. And an additional 152 of them were for homelessness, um, were ho homeless units. What's happening now as it relates to housing production under construction? Today, there are about 100, and, I mean, 1,092 units of housing in 18 projects currently under construction. 432 of those units are going to cater, are, are earmarked to, to house, households at 30% of their area median, median income. And we envision that all of those units will come online by summer of next year. Housing production that's awarded but not yet closed. There are 1,757 units of housing, 22 um, projects that, will, that have been partially funded or fully funded, and um, we are envisioning those will, will, will start to see those coming online shortly. With regards to this in, in 2022, nine of the 22 units we envision will close um, this year and will be moving under, under construction. Just today, Council Member Rain Bell and I were at the um, Bimacitas um, ground opening. That, that those 48 units are part of those numbers, of the, uh, the numbers that I'm reflecting here. Bloom Lake, flat, flat, Bloom Lake Flats is an example of the types of projects that um, we do um, through our investment. This project um, is an award um, in the ninth ward, and it was developed by, or is under development, and the developer is um, Project for Pride and Living. The city's contribution on this project is $1.3 million. The total investment for this project is $15.6 million. This one, um, is, I'm using this as an example of some of the, ty the types of projects that we fund. This has 42 units of housing and 30, um, 28 units of those um, um, 48, 42 units are catered to serving households at 30% of the area median income, including 21 units that will be um, designated as homeless units. As it relates to policy, in 2021, um, the ordinance was amended to um, allow for SRO units in, in Minneapolis. Um, David referenced that uh, the county has moved forward with the acquisition of four SRO units and two um, are, are um, going to be um, purchased here shortly. We also have some resources in, in um, um, through our, the, the, the opera funds to allow for the acquisition of, of um, SRO SRO units. We are currently working with Task Unlimited, um, who's proposing to do a, a project in, in Ward 5 that caters to serving households that um, um, going to be working, I mean, living in an in a, um, intentional, intentional community um, format um, through, through our work and, and um, funding from, from, from the state and I mean, from, from the county. Um, looking at putting, putting those, those individuals um, on track to, to experience 
um, housing that is safe and dignified. At this time, I'm going to transfer over to Andrea Brennan, um, Director Brennan, to um, wrap up. Thank you, Elfric. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Members, I hope what you've gleaned from this very um, consolidated uh, presentation is that we are, in, as a community, we are investing in homelessness response in ways that we have never invested before and to a much, much higher um, and greater degree. The city and the county together have committed over $200 million in the last couple of years toward housing and homelessness response for, through a combination of various federal pandemic-related relief funds. Most of these programs are still being implemented um, and we believe that these, the, the impacts and the solutions that we be, will be provided um, through these investments will be long lasting. Partnerships and collaboration are key. Uh, the ideas that you heard about today, um, like Avivo Village, like Homeward Bound, these are ideas, these are concepts that came forward um, through um, community and they were um, through federal funds and policy change and a lot of support, um, we were able to bring them to fruition. Housing focused case management is a national best practice. The county has significantly increased investments in creating the infrastructure and delivery systems to provide this housing uh, focused case management. And over the next few years, we will continue to partner with Hennepin County on um, on this implementation. Um, we will also continue to partner in creating more uh, permanent housing, permanent housing that serves people who are experiencing or at significant risk of experiencing um, homelessness through the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and other financial tools that we have. We will continue to invest in different types of housing, including single room occupancy or SRO housing and board and lodging. And we will continue to work um, in partnership um, with the county, with our community partners to ensure that um, the improvements to our shelter system are long lasting. And we will continue to partner with all levels of government and community organizations. Um, so I'd like to close out this presentation by um, showing a really brief video of something that happens at Avivo Village when somebody um, secures housing from Avivo Village. Can you all see your screen? our presentation and we would be happy to stand for any questions you have thank you for that um, I will manage things from the queue but also take a look across the dais um, our first comment our question is from Councilmember Wansley Warlaba thank you chair Palmasano um, thank you to the staff both here um, within Minneapolis and the county for today's presentation I know it's been um, one that many of us have uh, wanted to hear for quite some time. Um, I just have a couple of questions. The first being the reality. We've had a number of traumatic evictions that have happened since the start of the year. Um, even just one last week that utilized a immense amount of city resources. Um, one thing that I loved about the county presentation is um, a lot of the data of, of tracking from, you know, where folks are coming in from unsheltered and kind of moving across the pipeline based off of your services, the interventions that then shifts the outcome. I know we're in the early stages of gathering data, it sounds on the city side, but would love to know if there's any staff here um, that could speak to the number of individuals who um, from these evictions have been 
either moved into permanent housing, temporary housing uh, that's still waiting for placement or that is still unhoused. Um, and if we're correlating or tracking that data in partnership with the county. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam Chair, Councilmember Wansley Worlaba, um, I believe um, Director Garnett Hokuchuli is coming up here mm -hmm. to respond. But just to clarify, uh, it, the question is do we have data? Oh, no, specific. Specifically related to encampments? From our encampments, yes, on where we're also mapping out where people are in their housing journey. Do you feel? Sure. Well, thank you, um, mm -hmm. Madam Chair. Councilmember Wansley Warbala. Uh, we are in the process of developing that. As, as the county has indicated, we are working on doing that very thing. Again, this is very new for us, and so we are tracking it, and that is our goal, is to get to that very quickly. Again, in the last week, my manager has started to have those conversations on site with folks as well as with our other departments because that's where we want to be. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that's where we're striving to i just know that because when we don't have specific numbers like that related to those categories it really adds to this perception that evictions are being carried out with no goal of ending homelessness and having that ability to relay that information that tracking to the public um the second question that i have is recognizing that the bulk of resources um, is coming from the county um, is any of the work that we're planning to do, haven't started yet, um, is that gonna be impeding on the county's goals if we're dispersing people from our encampments um, who are also being centralized there? I know some of these encampments are a core site of engagement. So we'll love to hear about that. I can speak to that and then I'll okay. turn it over to you. The intention is to work very closely with the county and to nest into and to support and work together. We've already met with Erin Wexland, Wex Wexton, she is very much our counterpart in this. I've met with her and our new uh, manager, Chelsea McFerrin, has met with her and going to meet with her today. So we, this is very much a partnership to move together and not against. And I'll turn it over to David. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Council Member Wansley Wallaber. Uh, to, to answer a little bit on both pieces, actually, uh, what I would say, and I go back to, I was in for a spell particularly early on in daily attendance at the hygiene service area tent of the Hiawatha Franklin encampment that most of you will remember from 2018. And one of the things that was apparent then was that data systems and tracking, particularly around unsheltered homelessness, were inadequate. Um, we've done a lot of work to build our shelter system. Pre-2016, our shelter system data tracking was inadequate and we didn't know how people were moving through our shelters. We introduced the bed reservation system, the homeless management information system, shared data. That allowed us to do a much better job there. That is still work that needs to be uh, fully implemented in the unsheltered and the encampment space. I think I mentioned in my presentation, we're currently hiring an additional five people who will work with my planner on unsheltered homelessness, Aaron Wixton, calling that streets to housing. And that's really intended to build out our data infrastructure, almost to kind of, uh, if you think of kind of a shelter without walls, to have the same data, the same understanding of how people are moving in these unsheltered spaces as we currently have in our sheltered space. So that is something that we're building also. Along the way, we are allocating housing-focused case managers to people in encampments. Uh, they do stick with them as they move. This is a standard part of our work. We've actually, since we moved beyond the hotels to take referrals from any source, 62% uh, of the referrals have come from people who are in unsheltered settings. About 50% just over of the 127 that moved into housing have come from those settings. It has uh, taken longer with folks in unsheltered settings to move them to a permanent housing success and outcome. Part of that is to do with uh, the difficulty connecting with people over time as people are more mobile, uh, but it is something that we're committed to do and part of our work is to try and stay in contact with people and work with them towards that final goal of housing. And we anticipate building out those data systems and that partnership with the city to get better and better as the year goes on. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Director Hewitt. Um, I want to acknowledge, I think you've all done a, a very thorough job of, you know, crystallizing the data. Um, I'm interested, of course, in the city side of making sure that we're tracking as we're into, you know, re relating with you all. And I know this was somewhat addressed earlier, um, but I, I, knowing the tracking of government, I have to ask this for the record. Who is the final decision maker? I don't think you could speak to this, Director Hewitt, in executing our encampment evictions on the Minneapolis side.
Madam Chair, Council Member Wansley Warbala. Um, the decision not, does not sit on one person or one title. This is an enterprise decision that is weighted on um, health and safety of the folks on a property as well as the communities around them. The information is brought to all departments that are impacted, public works, um, CPED, health, regulatory services, um, and fire, and MPD. And we look at the data and we look and discuss with the mayor's office and it is a group decision. It is not one person who makes a decision to, to, to close an encampment. I just wanna be sure, cause we're having lots of conversation about government structure to get clarity on where decisions are made. And I know that our staff, a key component, is not acting kind of on your own without consultation with either the executive branch or the legislative branch. So just getting clarity that this isn't staff driven in terms of our encampment responses, or more specifically, the response to evict. Is that being driven by our staff when is, that decision is made? It is a city response. And I'm saying that um, this leads to my last question and when you're also saying city, because we're part of the city as a legislative body. Um, and from my understanding, I've been asking this, is there a policy on record? I've heard about the SROs, I've heard about the shelter ordinances. There is no space or a policy that council has moved around evictions. If that is not the case and recognizing that the county is a big part of this work, are we able to enter into a joint agreement where we can have a standardized regional evictions or encampment policy? Because from my understanding, this when we're talking about the city or the city enterprise, I'm not aware of that policy that authorizes at least legislative action around this. Fair enough. Operationally, uh, the city staff does convene and we look at all of the information that we have and look at the health and safety of these properties or this location and we make a decision. I can turn it over to David or on. I think you're good. I just want to get that clear because I've asked this, if there's action or a moment for a council, I think in hearing this information to move forward with taking legislative action to create a standardized policy and do so in partnership with the county. Um, and I think it's great that we're talking to all the stakeholder groups, residents, and I'm looking forward to working with our staff and knowing that there is an absence of this policy that legislatively we can take action on. Who is the best contact amongst this team, amongst the executive staff to collaborate with on moving this work I'll forward? To you. Director Brenner. Yes, um, Madam Chair, Councilmember Wansley um, Orlaba, I, I, I can't answer that right now in this forum and I, I, unless um, this body wants to take collective action and give staff some direction, I, I don't, I don't, um, I, frankly, I don't think it's appropriate to be calling out specific staff members and to be calling and asking for staff members to step forward and say, I am responsible in this area. That is not how we have um, operated or functioned as a staff team, working very collaboratively across disciplines, across departments, um, with a lot of consultation, with council leadership, with the mayor and his office. And so I would um, respectfully request that we move away from this line of questioning of staff and, um, and, Dr. and have Brennan, these I just want to restate my question. Form, I did not single out any specific staff. My question was, who is responsible for the decision, the ultimate decision making? As a legislative body, we can inquire about how decisions are made in order to gather information. There's, I think, some defensiveness because this is a sensitive conversation and it's one that we're having for the first time in public, and I get that. But to say that there's demonization of staff when council members are asking for information now, I think that's inappropriate. So I think we can absolutely collaborate because that is the charge of the legislative body is to create policy to gather information. And you all here to help serve us in that work. So this council is a spirit member, of collaboration to move in that work together. Council member, I'm gonna stop us there. Um, I, I think that they've given us a pretty comprehensive com uh, presentation for an hour now. 
Um, and there are several other, other questions and comments in queue. It is true that you don't take direction from us on the dais and we're not here to single out any member of a team that's trying to work together for the best outcomes. Council Member Osman, you're next in queue. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President. I, um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, David, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, I know you, you mentioned uh, families that are housed last couple of years, I think went from 1,500 to almost 300. As someone who has worked uh, in a housing setting and work with HMIS as a system, um, who have worked with those families, I know how important uh, that process with families that are getting out of the shelter and are going to stable uh, housing, how important it is. And in my experience, uh, it usually takes quicker, it takes uh, uh, three weeks, a, a month or so on for coordinating entry system and, and, and making sure we're, we're housing those folks. But what I have noticed is that there hasn't been any change for a single adult to, you know, maybe the number increased, it hasn't come down. Uh, and uh, I know it takes them a longer, even over a year to be housed. We have put so much effort in families, which is really a good thing that we want to make sure that uh, uh, small kids and families are sheltered. I have even seen families that are coming from outside the state, um, states like Chicago and Ohio, that came here, uh, that get into the system, and we house them um, uh, for the for the programs that exist in in, in the county, in the in the city, or even in the state. Uh, what efforts are we doing? How are you know? What do we need to do to put the same um, effort and same hard work that we have done in the family for single adults? Single adults have uh, are the ones that um, that are um, usually out, that are um, unsheltered individuals the most, that have so many different challenges uh, with mental health and, and and you know addiction and so on. So we want to make sure that um, what what is the plan uh, to address those and house single adults in a, a stable units. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Councilmember Osman. Uh, you're absolutely right, and obviously the numbers speak to this, that uh, our family homeless response system, while still not serving everyone that we want it to as well as we want it to, still too many children in shelter, uh, but nonetheless over the years has, has done a, a better job of bringing the numbers down. And, and there are reasons that has happened, and there are reasons it hasn't happened in the same way on the single adult side. If I look at the different, well, let me call out two differences, if I may. Uh, one is that preventing homelessness uh, for families, we see some things that work for families that do not seem to work in the same way for single adults. And I think here in particular about eviction prevention work. When the eviction moratorium came in, almost overnight, the number of families seeking shelter because they had nowhere else to stay dropped, and it stayed low throughout the eviction moratorium. We saw no change in the number of single adults approaching the Adult Shelter Connect operated by Simpson Housing Services for shelter. None at all. We were still seeing the same number of people. And that kind of confirmed a, a theory we'd had for some time, which is that uh, if evictions are part of the journey to homelessness for single adults, they're often way back in the past, and there's a long series of events that follows before somebody literally turns up needing shelter. So eviction prevention is proving really effective at keeping families out of shelter, and it is not having the same effect on keeping single adults out of homelessness. So we have an intervention that works there for families, not as well for single adults. We have to try some different things. In particular, I think where we need to build systems and work that we're doing with our colleagues in human services at Hennepin County is how do we work with youth coming out of the foster care system? What are the systems on the single side that are exiting people to homelessness or from which people are only up in homelessness that are different from the family side. Uh, and we've been working with our public housing authorities to get more rental assistance vouchers for youth who have foster care involvement. And we've just managed to get a HUD grant that will provide support services to go with them. And that will provide for an extra 200 youth, as an example, in the next couple of years. So we're having to do different things on the prevention side. And we need to build that. We've done a better job for families. Uh, in terms of moving families out, as you say, you go into shelter, you get that coordinated entry assessment, you hopefully get referred to a rapid rehousing program, let's say, pretty quickly. 
And the whole time you are in shelter, you have that room available to you 24 hours a day. You're checking in with somebody. Um, we stay connected to you. That was woefully absent in the single adult system before the pandemic, where if you think about it, I think about uh, shelters as kind of the emergency room of a housing emergency, right? Uh, but we had folks coming in at nine in the night, 100 in a room, with one person watching over them and then leaving again at nine in the morning. It is no surprise that in a system like that, and then the next day it's 20 different people, 20 of them don't come back, you've got 20 other people in there. It is no surprise in that kind of environment, which with very low levels of staffing, large numbers of people being served, nobody there for much of the day, which is when you could actually do the work to connect people to housing, that that system was failing people and failing them badly. It was overcrowded, it was overnight only, it was inadequate to meet people's needs, and it was no surprise that we were not seeing the same progress housing single adults. Now, I do believe, and that's why we focus the federal stimulus investments where we have, and we are seeing the benefits now, and will continue to, even though there's a long, long way to go still, I do believe that things like making shelters 24-7, bringing down the numbers, things like Avivo Village, and we saw the ringing of the bells as they get housed. The fact that people now can come to a shelter and are able to stay there, stay connected, and work with a case manager, it looks more like the family system. So my hope is that, mm -hmm. and my expectation, frankly, is that we will see similar progress on the single adult side as we have seen historically on the family side if we stay this course. I will, with... Uh, the, committee's indulgence, just flag one concern that I have in terms of being able to stay the course is that we are using federal stimulus dollars. These are one-time dollars. And certainly something that we have been flagging at the state legislature is right now Avivo Village is, is we've committed funding as the county through the stimulus period to the end of 2024. Same for Homeward Bound, same for the case managers. We need federal and state dollars to come in and enable us to continue these things. Part of the reason the single adult shelter system has been so inadequate historically is that it was entirely based on private philanthropy and to some extent county property tax. There was no federal and state support coming in. Right now we have the federal and state support and we're able to make a difference, but we need to be able to continue that. We can't go backwards in 2025. So I just flagged that as a concern that I have. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, one last question, uh, it's for uh, Director Garnett. Um, I know um, city respond to unsheltered uh, homelessness has been probably the most challenging in my experience. Um, someone who came in with uh, six encampments, uh, folks that um, lived in, in Ward 6 area. And I, I remember talking about last year uh, during the budget markups, uh, I moved about 50K for to really increase the outreach staff. Um, the outreach staff of, of uh, homelessness for, for the city, for them to go there and really have that uh, first interaction uh, with the individuals that, that need the help. Um, you know, they, they were going with bare hand, absolutely no resource with them. Um, uh, it's very challenging already uh, in um, the safety and the health concern in the encampments that are in that area. But uh, as a city, we were sending these individuals that I actually walk with them and, and visit it uh, with them with um, uh, just hoping that they will talk to the individual and help them with housing and so on. Um, uh, they didn't have a vehicle. They were driving their own vehicles to get there. And I think that that just shows that we have to do more um, uh, to, equip, to equip these individuals to really do uh, their job safe and um, I know uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very challenging, but actually that is the famous initial help for those individuals and they could be housed. So uh, just a question, what is um, now that it's moved from the health to that, what capacity, well, how many, what would you say that uh, how many outreach team uh, do we need to really address uh, uh, the on shelter homelessness in our communities, and uh, what kind of resources, and uh, hopefully for the city plan uh, and the budget coming up next year or so on, what 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 do we need to do as a as a city to help you uh, to make sure that we are increasing uh, the outreach staff and giving the resource to uh, go help these folks? Well, Madam Chair, uh, Council Member Osmond. 
So I do thank you for the support. That 50000 was uh, dedicated to the health, and I believe it was for a vehicle. And I learned about that information or that those resources when, uh, when we worked through the budget office to start moving um, the folks and the resources under regulatory services. I will say when, when, when we decided or when the decision was made to bring the team together instead of having it in two different um, departments, I made the ask that if I was, if Reg Services was to absorb this team and really formalize it, that we needed resources. To your point, that's why we hired uh, a manager for that. Again, Chelsea McFerrin. And I also asked for a fleet vehicle as well to make sure that our staff could be out in the field, not in their own vehicles, but out in the field, maybe a larger vehicle to um, be able to have folks come in if it's a, if the weather's not nice to be able to work. So we are doing, now that, that the resources that you allocated to us are now under my purview, I am looking at what that really means and outfitting, um, I believe it was a van of some sort. Uh, so I am quickly trying to understand and utilize your resource and to make sure that we do have that. We do have other supplies that came from health, boots, gloves, and things of that nature and supplies that we do have and that we do give out. Again, this is the almost the second week now that this team is under the department and we are doing the analysis right now and Chelsea is um, amazing and she's looking at the very thing that you're asking for. So give us a month and I'll be able to meet with you and let you know the resources that we knew, do need as we approach the budget time. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, one last comment, just uh, I think it's very important to, to have uh, a policy uh, on dismantling um, any encampment in, in, in our city. And if that is something that city doesn't have, I'm willing to, I think, uh, Council Member Orlobar is a great point and that we, we do need uh, a policy to for the city to go to address those uh, uh, issues when, when it comes to dismantling uh, encampments. As someone who has experience, um, you know, um, money encampments in my, in my district, uh, they bring a lot of challenges and those folks definitely need help. We wanna make sure we're respectful, uh, treat them as a human, at the same time also caring the safety and health for the residents that live in our neighbors. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanna add one comment. And the goal of having the homeless response team in reg services is not to have encampments at all, okay? I, the city, that should not be our solution. That's why the county, that's why we've got CPED, that's why we've got health. We're talking about in this city, how does an encampment can't and should not be an option? There are other things that we can and must do upstream to address these issues. And it's not one issue, it's not the lack of housing only. It's mental health, it's opioid, it's education, it's access, it's racism, it's all of these things. So I wanna be clear, encampments cannot be the solution. That cannot be the solution or the answer to homelessness. It's very much what the county and what we are striving to as a city, and we're starting at ground zero. Actually, quite frankly, we're at negative 10. So my goal with having this team in my department is that we don't have encampments. I wanna be very clear on that. I don't enjoy this. It pains my heart as a, as a child of this city that I actually choose to work for. I do not want encampments and that is not an option or a solution for us as a staff perspective. Thank you. Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I uh, first want to thank the thank Director Hewitt and Director Brennan and the entire team. I really appreciate this presentation and the tremendous amount of work that that we as a city have 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 done on this issue. Um, it's not lost on me. Uh, you know, for my colleagues who maybe don't realize, I in um, uh, as of 2018 when I came onto the council, we kind of considered attacking this issue. 
broadly, we had a few things here and there, but we kind of considered this issue as something that was relegated to the county. And so the fact that we've sort of staffed up, that we've put so much, so many resources, that we've hired folks to, to address this issue as a city, and that we as a city have become a, a sort of a major partner in how we address this issue, I think is a really big deal, is to be celebrated. And uh, I just wanted to say that and, and thank you and your team. There's a few things that, uh, you know, I am sort of concerned about that I wanted to uh, ask, uh, and I'm not sure who's the most appropriate person, but I know that a big part of why we're able to put so many, uh, such a large effort uh, as a city and as a county is because of the amount of resources. Uh, Director Hewitt talked about um, uh, uh, the ARPA funding. You know, we have some at the city. Uh, yeah, Mr. Pinka pointed that out as well, that how much we've put in as a city and county. Um, are we anticipating sort of a financial or a funding cliff that we're going to run into? How, how far out are we from that? And, uh, you know, what does it entail for, for the response that we've built thus far? <clears throat> Madam Chair, Councilmember Ellison, that's a really excellent point, and I'm, I will take a stab at responding to part of it, and then we'll turn it over to my colleague here. Um, I think that it, it, certainly we're, we're, we're funding a lot of the improvements in our system through these one-time funds, which, which is of concern. Um, I will say, though, that we have approached this work from the very beginning, and we as a city and as the county has as well, understanding that they're one-time funds and making investments that are strategic investments that will have long-lasting effects. And um, again, I'll let um, Director Hewitt talk about this in more detail, but I mean, the fact that you know a, lo a lot of counties and a lot of cities in, the, in this country, they leased hotels. Um, they leased hotel spaces. And here, I mean, our county went and purchased hotels that will then be able to be, and then they used the one-time ARPA funding to, um, you know, to transform them into permanent housing. So there are some things that we did very strategically in collaboration, and um, I think also just the city and the county aligning our strategies to make sure that they were, um, that they, they, they supported one another. But that's an example of using those one-time funds in a way that, um, that will, you know, provide for long-lasting benefits. Um, uh, and I, I think maybe I'll ask David to talk about the, um, because there are concerns about the, the ongoing operations funding um, for these shelters that we do need to, to think about. Yeah, Andrea, uh, Madam Chair, Council Member Ellison. Uh, yes, I am concerned. Uh, as has been shared, you know, when we look at, for instance, our American Rescue Plan dollars, the 46 million that the county has allocated to housing is one-time capital funding. It is the purchase of hotels. Uh, and the model that, we're, that we've kind of developed there is that we lease for a nominal fee to a property manager and they are able to charge a rent in that deeply affordable range of kind of 350 to 550 a month and that covers the operating costs ongoing. So in those capital investments, we have a long-term model built in and it's the one-time funds that were needed. But we do have a significant fiscal cliff specifically in the area of uh, emergency homeless shelters uh, where we have invested one-time stimulus dollars knowing we needed these services in our community and we needed them to be better than they had been but historically there has not been federal or state funding for them to enable them to continue at the kind of scale they are now and specifically uh, I believe uh, as the city you currently have two million dollars invested in Avivo Village that will need to be replaced next year so there's a two million financial cliff hitting us at the, at the end of December at the end of 2024, which is the end of the county American Rescue Plan uh, stimulus dollars, an additional two million financial cliff hits for Avivo Village and a two million cliff hits for Homeward Bound. That is also three million in housing focused case management, three million in keeping all of the other shelters 24 seven. In all, we are facing a $13 million a year financial cliff by 2025. Now, we had, uh, we supported and had support at the House and the Senate in the current legislative session to introduce a bill specifically to address that fiscal cliff that was heard through the homeless prevention and, and elsewhere at the legislature. So we are flagging this and we are saying we cannot go backwards as a community. We cannot go back to overcrowded overnight only shelters. We need to do what is working and we need to sustain these efforts if we're to avoid that West Coast scenario. But we do need support from the state and federal government and, and that is a very real pressure that's just a couple of years out for us. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to raise that and, and highlight that uh, here. 
Thank you. And I, you know, hope my colleagues and as well as the state <laughs> is, is listening because, um, you know, that that timeline is come is going to is going to be upon us uh, pretty quickly. Um, um, a few other questions that I had, uh, I'll try to run through this quickly because I know we've all been here and there's a few more folks in queue. Um, uh, I know that um, there was mentioned earlier about the way that we sort of track is is by utilizing these point in time counts. Uh, it sounded like there were several uses of point in time counts or uh, or was that is it sort of we do one and there's a federal one or is there just the federal one and we lean on on those numbers and participate just wanted to clar clarify that for myself thank you uh, madam chair councilman Rallison. uh federal point in time count is one measure of tracking uh it has its weaknesses as i've already spoken about its strength is that it's basically the same every year and it's the same across the country uh but it is not a great system, certainly for uh, Council Member Wansley Waller, but uh, to your point, that kind of daily tracking and if people are moving, how we keep them connected to services, the point in time count is useless for that, frankly. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that is where the homeless management information system needs to come in and there's a lot of work to make it as functional as it needs to be. We've done great work with shelters to make sure that we have really good shelter data and are able to track people real time. So I know that you were at that shelter on Tuesday, then you disappeared for two days, then you were at that shelter on Thursday, and you're, you're there right now on Friday. So if I, as your caseworker, need to call you up to say a landlord's willing to talk to you, I, I know where you are. Mm -hmm. We do not have that level of tracking in HMIS for unsheltered settings right now. That is what the team that we're bringing on in the streets to housing are intended to build for us because we recognize that that's a gap. That real-time tracking is where we want to get to. Point in time count has limited utility. It's really just helpful for big trends and trajectories. Yeah, thank you. And, and that leads me to the, so, sort of the question that I had was, you know, sort of how, how far do we track when, you know, when we have someone that's, that we're working with to get housing, how far up do we track them? For example, you know, we know that we have a certain number of people who are on the street. We know that we have a certain number of people who are in the shelter system. We know that we've helped a certain number of people secure housing. Um, but probably at you know very very low income housing, do we track them once that person does sort of become upwardly mobile, so that we know uh, whether or not we're sort of putting more pressure or less pressure on our low income housing stock? Yeah. Thank you, Councilman. So the homeless management information system is used by all homeless designated programs. Not if people go into other housing on their own independently, they move back in with family, we may not have data beyond they moved in with family unless they come back into the system. So when we look at things like retention rate, one of the things that we look at is returns to homelessness. Did How many individuals came back into the shelter system or back into an outreach engagement after they had been housed? Now there are folks who move into permanent supportive housing. Those permanent supportive housing also use this system. So we have data on them ongoing. And in actual fact, growth in income is one of the measures for those programs. Um, as we, we have things that we report up to HUD out of the, the Homeless Management Information System, uh, seven key performance measures, I think. My colleague here, if, if they were here, could correct me. But one of them is how many people that are moved into housing are increasing income uh, getting into employment. I should add, just on that, uh, three and a bit million of the American Rescue Plan funds allocated by the county we're actually to set up contracts with providers to provide employment and training services. So as our case managers are moving people into housing, for a subset of them that are working, but perhaps not earning enough and could earn more or want to get back into work, uh, can we connect them on? So we have set up contracts with providers, including culturally specific providers, so that we're helping people take that next step wherever possible. Because we do think, you know, we want people to not just uh, get into housing, but also to thrive in housing, of course. And then I've got two more questions, and I apologize to my colleagues for the number of questions, but I think they should be short. One is, um, and I believe that if I had been able to track the math right, I could have answered this myself, but um, I know that we, there was some discussion of how many low-income sort of units we're building on an annual basis. I know that we're helping folks uh, through the hotel system. You mentioned 1,000 folks get securely housed through that system, I think, and, and there's the about 90% retention rate there. Uh, so my basic question is, you know, um, to how quickly or along what timeline are we sort of maybe building our, like building housing, building ourselves out of this problem? Sorry, that's my question. So, yeah. So like, yeah. I'll leave that for to it. the extent that that question can be answered. <laughs> yeah. I would say the, the approach that, that's employed is we go through a request for proposals process that allows for 
developers to make a request. And when, once the funds are awarded, it takes about 12, I mean, um, two years for the construction to, to um, for, the, for, the, for that project to be fully funded to enable that construction to, to close. Um, with regards to how many units we fund on an annual basis, for the 30% units, we're probably are not 200 unit um, range on an annual basis. Thank you. And these are all things that I kind of know, but I also thought it was important just for the public to kind of hear, you know, how many folks are we housing, how many folks are coming in, uh, becoming homeless, and then, you know, to what extent are we building ourselves out of this problem? And if we want to build more, what level of resources is that going to take? Um, the last thing I, I wanted to ask about is, uh, uh, at least in a broad sense, I know that uh, encampments have become one of the most visible, you know, sort of portions of, 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 of this issue. Um, and, um, and how we sort of manage encampments is, has be also become one of those sort of points of debate, really, uh, a really emotional topic for people because, you know, it is folks getting moved off of a place that they've been. And I, and I fully agree with, uh, director Garnett, who truly that, uh, that we don't want to see encampments in our city. Um, but we're also living in a reality where we, where we do see them. They, they are there regardless of whether we want to see them there. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and so all of our strategies should be aimed on at, should be aimed towards figuring out how to make sure that we, that we can, we can eliminate encampments in our city. My question is, you know, for the strategy that we've employed, I know that I've heard from encampment residents that I've tried to stay in touch with sort of a, a mixed response. Some encampment residents who feel like, you know, Hey, look, we, you know, I was living in an encampment. I was, I'm thinking of a group that was over by the river in my ward. Uh, and they felt like they sort of got, uh, the, uh, you know, treated really well in that process. I know other folks have expressed that they don't feel like they've been treated really well in that process. So my question is, you know, when it comes to the effectiveness of how we've managed encampment response, and by effectiveness, I mean like, you know, uh, how many encampments do we have or how many less encampments do we have year to year? Um, <clears throat> what do those numbers look like? You know, whether it's like, how many do we have now compared to this time last year? Or how many do we have now compared to the, the, at the beginning of the year? Uh, are those things that we're able to track and, and, and are we seeing improvement on that front? And that's my last question. Sure, thank you, um, Madam Chair, Councilmember Ellison. A um, couple of questions in there. Um, first, um, the, the, I mean, in, 20, in the summer of 2020, we had over 100 encampments throughout the city. And one encampment, Powderhorn Park, there were over 300 um, tents that were there, 300 households that were, that were at that house, in that encampment. So relative to the summer of 2020, significant, we've seen a significant reduction in encampments. And, and even since last summer, there's, there's a significant um, reduction in encampments. And I don't know if we have any, someone can step up here if we have more specific data than that. But um, I also wanted to go back to the, the issue of the policy. And um, the policy that the city, I mean, the city has multiple policies that, that have some bearing on the issue of encampments. Um, one of the policies is actually an ordinance that um, prohibits camping on, um, you know, prohibits people from, um, er, you know, erecting tents or structures and, um, and, 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 and staying there um, on public land. So that is an ordinance of the city of Minneapolis. And, um, you know, as, as Saray um, indicated earlier, there are multiple departments that are involved in um, enforcing various aspects of that. There's also tends to be a lot of accumulation of things um, at encampments. And then there are different city policies and ordinances that kick in that require some in enforcement and, and regulation in those instances as well. Um, we have, while we don't have a policy um, that has been adopted by the city council, um, we, we certainly have um, operational procedures that we've followed. And I think to your question, Councilmember Ellison, um, you know, the, this process and these, this, um, these procedures have really evolved over time. We've learned a lot. We've learned a lot since the, um, the Wall of Forgotten Natives um, encampment and the navigation center that the city sent up, set up. Um, we've learned a lot um, through um, bringing on um, more investment and more capacity. And um, we have, um, as, as a city, as a staff team, we've really prioritized a person-centered approach to um, encampments and making sure that we are working with partners, with our, our county caseworker partners, with, um, with 
uh, uh, Hennepin County um, Healthcare for the Homeless, with nonprofit organizations, with service organizations to make sure that we are going out and we are trying to make a person-to-person -person connection with everybody who is experiencing unsheltered homelessness. And that has been our priority. That has been um, the process that we have, have followed. And, um, and again, we've, we've learned through um, different um, experiences at different um, encampments about what, what has worked and, and, you know, well, and what hasn't, as, you know, <laughs> you mentioned, Councilor Ellison, that there's been a difference in, in experiences. And I think, you know, we've all, we've all learned from that. And one of the things that, um, you know, as part of the, the practice is that um, we, we aren't um, closing an encampment before many, many, many days of um, very, um, you know, strategic and targeted, um, you know, efforts to make real connections with people and connect people with the services that, that they need. Um, and that has, I think, gotten a lot better as we've moved through um, our experience um, in, in how we best uh, provide services at encampments. But again, you know, we continue um, we continue to learn. Um, we continue to learn from hearing from people who um, have experience of, of staying in encampments through our partners, our community partners, um, and through our experience that we have on our staff teams. And um, we, we continue to try to improve how we deliver those services. Thank you. Council Member Chavez will be the last in queue. Oh, Madam Chair, thank you. I just want to start um, by thanking our city staff and county staff for these presentations uh, and for all the work that you all do. It doesn't go unnoticed. I know there's been a lot of investments in affordable housing, the Vivo Village, the Homeward Bound Shelter for Native Americans, the recent approval of the Women's Shelter. I know that when I've asked city staff for hand washers and bathrooms, they've been able to accommodate that. So I just want to say thank you for that work. Um, I'm in current conversations with the mayor on what it could look like to have an Avivo village here on the south side. I think that would be an asset for our community. I represent a ward that has a lot of encampments. And uh, one thing that I do want to talk about is that when we clear encampments, it just pops up on the next block. So there's a lot of work that we as a council have to do uh, to make sure that we can actually address what is happening. As I finish my fourth month as a council member, I've learned a lot. And one thing that keeps happening um, is in conversations is how we address encampments and support our unhoused neighbors in a way that keeps everybody uh, safe. Notices of encampment clearings no longer happen. Uh, this happened exactly on the 25th and 14th Avenue South. It's the area that I represent. And I believe it also happened in Ward 6, the one on Lake, on Lake Street. They also tend to bring a heavy police presence that doesn't help with the safety of our unhoused neighbors, our residents in the area, nor does it help with the safety of the police officers in our city. I have two questions regarding that. Does the city plan to notice encampment clearings uh, to council members and the residents of the encampments? And why do we send MPD to encampments? And can we strategize together as a city on how we can do a new method moving forward as it tends to traumatize a lot of the people that I represent? Madam Chair, Council Member Chavez. In terms of noticing, um, and again, I, this is before I was fully engaged in this, is, is we did want to, and we did notify uh, that we were, after we provided a number of weeks of resources and folks did uh, decide to take go into shelter or accept the resources, we would notice an encamp we would notice a location. And we were in the practice of doing so. However, there was one day where we did that and it was aggressive. And city staff were harmed. So as a result, and it got very contentious and 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 very volatile. And I was actually on that site and I felt unsafe and I watched my city staff be physically harmed for doing her job. And so as a result, um, 
we do get on site and we do notice that we are there is every intention to in encampment and provide services again with the city as well as the county and other partners and we were no longer able to post because there were threats against city staff and we had to make an operational decision so that is why we are dealing with what we're dealing with i will tell you that we have since in the last two months we have address certain um, spaces without MPD presence. That's the preferred option. So that is why we are where we are. Well, thank you, Director. The thing, um, one, I just wanna state that no staff should ever be put in harm's way. That is not okay. I've been following all the encampment clearings that have happened this year, and people still send out information of when the encampment clearings are happening. So people will show up whether we post it or not. Um, the safety of our public work staff should be really critical in this, and so should the safety of our unhoused neighbors and their personal belongings as well. The benefit in noticing council members and encampment residents is that they can make sure that they can find a place safely and that they can actually take their belongings with them. Do we have a policy in place uh, to ensure that we can protect people's belongings so they aren't being damaged or being thrown away? Absolutely. So we, uh, the last several times we do have a process and a procedure on site that folks can uh, take all their items and they are stored for a number of weeks and we are in the process of signing a, a contract with DID, am I correct on that? Uh, to hold their storage as well. So there is a process and uh, we do assist folks in, 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 in helping them pack their things, and then we also give them information on where they can come and get it. So yes, that is part of the process. Thank you, and that's news to me, so I'll probably no, just follow has... up offline oh, sure. and just figure out in ways that we can work as a council to probably improve the policy. I've been reached out multiple times and I've seen videos of just people's stuff being you know, taken away and people tend to have their belongings, they have it for years and then it disappears. So I think it just tells me, and as a policymaker, the legislative body, I wanna work with our, our direct, you director and our city council to figure out if there's um, improvements to a policy that need to be made to make sure that the people I represent's belongings are actually safe and, and kept. So I appreciate, I didn't know there was a policy and I wanna work with you to help address that. It is, and, a, pra it is a practice and I look forward to having conversations with you about it. And then the last part is, uh, what proactive measures are we taking to ensure that everybody is being connected to housing, shelters, before clearing encampment. I've talked to multiple residents in encampments, and oftentimes what happens, um, they let me know that uh, they aren't being connected to services, that nobody has talked to them. And I'm not here to say that people are telling me the truth or they're lying to me, but as a council member, I take that very seriously and wanna figure out like what the procedure or process is as a council, as a city, uh, to help ensure that we are connecting every single person to services beside, before we decide to you know, get rid of an encampment. Mm -hmm. No, that's a priority for us as well. Um, typically the staff would meet on site and they would go to every site, they'd reach out to every person, provide resources, and, and try to connect them to services, also really working with Hennepin County. One of the things that um, Ms. McFerrin is working on is to get better at that, right? So we, we're we trying to figure out how do we um, start tracking and adding to the data that Hennepin County is doing and really meeting people where they are and understanding who they are and why are we in this situation. So we are in the process of really fine tuning and honing this now, now that we have a dedicated staff and support and resources to allow, to support them in doing the things that they, we really want to be doing, and that is a very much uh, of a priority for us and things that Chelsea and I talk about regularly. Awesome, yeah, I just wanna say, oh, I don't have any more questions, but I do wanna say thank you. I, I'll be following up in regards to like the, the storing policy, figuring out how we can work as a city to improve that, um, and then if we can strategize as a city, maybe sending a different kind of response to encampments. I think sending MPD doesn't, <laughs> help uh, the situation, it helps escalate it. So just want to appreciate your work and your willingness to work on us with that. Thank you. Madam Chair, Councilmember Chavez, I just wanted to chime in on what um, 
what director um, was saying, the um, in addition to the staff that we have in house that provides um, outreach to um, people living in encampments, we also contract with three different community organizations: American Indian Community Development Corporation, Avivo, and um, St. Stephen's. Um, we, you know, they have outreach teams that we contract with, and they are also out um, connecting with um, whenever. There is, um, whenever there's not just an encampment, but connecting with people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness um, in all areas of our city. So that's another place and another, another system that we use to make sure that we're making those connections. And I do want to add another comment, is that we have been sending updates to council on all of the work and the times that we provide and are out to every encampment. So you do have an understanding of the locations of these encampments, the number of services that we provide, and what's kind of going on. Again, we are trying to expound upon that information to give you a better picture and understanding of what we are doing and what is actually on site. So that more to come once we finish our transition. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here today um, and for this conversation. I appreciate it. I will ask the clerk to please receive and file this report. Colleagues, I've had conversation with a couple of you. We are going to move right along because the time is 311, um, and we're going to keep on going. We might we give the grace of people who need to get up for a couple minutes, people who don't want to be here for the next presentation, and there are some people here for the next presentation who obviously are going to want to filter in. These three next agenda items are part of our government structure subcommittee. If you need to bulldoze people's it, stuff, if excuse you me. Reason to try to get and fail to get Excuse me, if I could ask you to leave. If I could ask you to take. Excuse me, sir. Sir, I need to ask. Sir, I need to ask you to leave. Sir, I need to ask you to leave. There is not public comment today. We don't have a public hearing or a public comment period today. I, I appreciate your comments. They, those aren't public comments because we're not in that type of setting right now. We're moving on to the next topic. This subcommittee, we're, we're now in the government structure subcommittee. This subcommittee was established to receive reports on implementation of the executive mayor legislative council governance structure. As such, our next item is an update from Mayor Fry on his executive reorganization proposal as part of the new voter approved government restructure pursuant to Charter Amendment number 184. I will invite Mayor Fry to give that presentation on this item. Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, Council Members. It's an honor to be here with you today to provide an update and perhaps some more information regarding the changes to government structure that we were presenting approximately a month ago. Uh, there's a slide show that should be up here uh, that presents the organizational chart. This is the chart that many of you have already seen. Uh, it provides the uh, six approximate, uh, five to six direct reports to the mayor, including the chief administrative officer of the, an office of public service, uh, a city attorney, a chief safety officer, uh, a chief of staff, um, which would be the four reporting to the mayor, and then of course the other side represents the council where you see both the city clerk as well as the city auditor, uh, and of course residents are the ones that are overseeing all of it. Uh, this is a chart you've already seen. There, there aren't, uh, I don't think, any changes that have been made to the specific chart, certainly nothing significant. Um, if you can move to the next level. So we have divided the work into four implementation planning groups. Recognizing that this is an enterprise effort, we need enterprise-wide work and analysis to take place as we set up the best possible system. Uh, the government structure implementation planning groups, as you can see, include legal, operational impacts, office of community safety, office of public service, communications, and race equity impact analysis. Next slide, please. 
So I'm going to go through each one of these and just give you a basic rundown of what each one of these planning groups will be doing. And again, it is comprehensive intentionally because everything that we're going to do impacts everything else. Uh, you can't just pull one lever uh, and uh, it, this needs to be a comprehensive analysis. So for legal, uh, the overarching task is to draft the necessary changes to the city charter and or the city ordinances and also to identify strategies for implementation, including an evaluation of both pros and cons and deliverables that will include drafts and changes to the charter and code. As many of you know, there's a, a relatively complex sequence that needs to take place for both potentially charter and ordinantial changes and we wanna make sure we do it properly. The lead on this particular group will be Eric Nielsen from the city attorney's office. The, the next piece is, is operational impacts. Uh, the goal here is to determine what administrative actions need to take place to ensure a smooth implementation. We're gonna develop a timeline for the structural changes to be completed, and we wanna identify any changes to the budget that may be needed in short and long term. Uh, there will be deliverables, and they'll include identification of changes to the budget, changes to technology, position descriptions and reporting requirements uh, needed to implement structure by midsummer, uh, with work beginning on those changes on an ongoing basis as identified. So the, the, the basic concept here is that as we implement a new government, we're gonna need to have additional positions in some areas, we're gonna have to, need to have change around technology, and we're gonna need to make sure that people understand a simple and concrete reporting structure so that accountability remains intact across the board. Next, please. Next is the Office of Community Safety. Uh, I won't get into the substance uh, of the strategy, but what I will say is what the task group here is gonna be doing. They're gonna be identifying resources across the enterprise that can help facilitate the success of the Office of Community Safety. That's working with HR to draft a job analysis questionnaire uh, for the head of this department. Uh, deliverables will include a detail organization chart for the office, a draft job analysis questionnaire for um, both the, the head as well as potentially other individuals on top of that. Uh, and we also wanna make sure that it's properly coordinated and ensures a uh, proper um, implementation of both, uh, of, of every single one of the respective divisions beneath or departments, whether that is police, office of violence prevention, fire, EMS, et cetera. Um, this is gonna be a heck of a lot of work and staff have, will be, have been directed and will be moving down this route. <clears throat> Next uh, is the Office of Public Service Structure Implementation Planning Group. Uh, and they are tasked with identifying synergies and resources across the enterprise. Uh, they're tasked with clarifying points of intersection and identifying implementation challenges. Specific functions to be evaluated as to their placement in the enterprise include sustainability, trafficking, arts department, uh, community policing specialists, race and equity, among others. And so the whole concept is where best will these specific entities lie? Uh, and truthfully, we don't have all of the answers yet. That's the whole point. The whole point is that we want to undergo a thorough analysis that accounts for everything else that is also being set up in the government at the same time so we have the most streamlined, efficient, and inclusive form of government that can be effectuated. Next is communications. Uh, the task here is to develop a strategy for communicating about the status of the implementation, both internally and externally, uh, and deliverables would include a strategic communication plan for the governance structure work, including message content as needed. Uh, and Greta Bergstrom will be the lead of this. Uh, I've, I'm realizing that I failed to mention the lead of some of the other groups, and I'll just relay that to you right now. So for the Office of Public Service, it would be Heather Johnston as a lead of the group. Uh, for the Office of Community Safety, it would be Barrett Lane. And for operational impacts, it would be Dashani Dye of Finance. Next uh, government structure implementation group was, is the Race Equity Impact Analysis. Uh, the task here is to prepare 
a race equity impact analysis for eventual ordinance changes uh, to help identify issues to ensure that the goals of the equitable provision of city services is achieved. Deliverables could include the, a complete REIA for the proposed charter as well as code changes. The lead on this group is Taisha Green. And then finally, you can see here a timeline. Uh, you have it here in front of you, so I'm not going to read out each one of the specific points, but it begins with uh, the Council's Charter Implementation Subcommittee, uh, which is what we're doing right now, uh, and it'll end ultimately on December 9, 2022, which is the last date that changes could be implemented to the Charter this calendar year. The goal, of course, is to get this set up as expeditiously as possible, uh, while, of course, balancing for the the need and the urgency in having a government structured as soon as possible. And I'll tell you, uh, we do need to move expedi expeditiously on this because uh, as of right now, uh, we have an executive form of government that, that has more than 20 direct reports. Uh, and as a practical matter, that doesn't work. Uh, so uh, with that, um, happy to open it to questions that you may have, council members, and thank you for the time. Thank you for that presentation. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as a lot of folks know, I introduced uh, the concept of a Department of Public Safety. And I think that that initial uh, proposal is certainly going to dovetail in with what you're proposing here today. And I just have a clarifying question about what role City Council has as the legislative body in making sure that these structural changes to the government are actually implemented successfully, as opposed to the role of the executive branch. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member Payne, excellent question. The City Council is ultimately approving the structure that we're laying out here. Uh, so it is within your purview, of course, uh, to ask additional questions, uh, to make decisions as to how ultimately a department and our entire city government should be structured. Um, as uh, to for the, uh, the proposal that, that was put forward, um, I think there's certainly some areas of agreement as well as some areas of, of disagreement. I'm happy to, to get into those, but uh, once the department itself, ha whatever form it takes, is set up, uh, the city council continues to have an audit function uh, to make sure that they are, uh, well, auditing uh, the actions of both the, the individual divisions as well as the full department. Thank you. Councilmember Wansley Warlaba. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Thank you, Mayor Fry, for being here. I have a couple of questions. One kind of builds upon uh, Council Member Payne's question. Um, so the organization chart or information that we're receiving about government structure, of course, is being presented as an administrative reorganization. Um, but also, I want to be clear, this is political. We can talk about being neutral and administrative, but actions have already shown that this restructure appear, appear to be based off of also political motive. I do not want to note the absence of that rather than research in data. So I want to clarify because we've already seen this earlier. Our charge in this body is to legislate off the best interests of our constituents, especially since we represent 30,000 each constituents. Um, and at the time, as you noted, there's going to be moments where council might not agree with the priorities of the office. So with that question, and that's fine, because that's democracy, and you mentioned this of accountability remaining intact, I'm interested, can you point to where the specific checks and balances exist in this organization structure, um, and how those checks and balances prevent unelected administrators that you appoint um, to not stall um, the work of the legislative body, as well as are not charged with carrying out your own political priorities. So really would love to know the checks and balances that you're considering with this structure. Council member, I'm gonna ask you to rephrase that question. I, I do appreciate your comments. You're making some allegations and we promise that on this day is we don't make allegations against each other. I think that your question is about are there checks and balances on the executive side of your organization structure? And is I want to know, I'm not making allegations. I'm noting that we work in a political environment. And to note that 
this structure is not used for advancing those political motives, but to actually allow our administrative staff to carry out the priorities of our respective branches. So yes, the checks and balances. Thank you for trying to recapture that. Madam Chair, Council Member Wamsley Warlaba, uh, to the first point that we implemented this particular government with a, a political light, the answer is no. Uh, first, question one was passed. Now, uh, granted politics do take place in an election, but once a uh, voter approved amendment to the charter is made, that is the direction that we are required to go forward in by law. The vantage point that we have taken in setting this government up is around efficiency, inclusivity, and responsiveness. The determination as to whether department heads report to the council or the mayor is not one that is a subject of these determinations before us. That decision has already been made. Now, with respect to checks and balances, yes, indeed, they do exist. And it depends on what department you're talking about. We already have checks and balances that are available under, for instance, civil rights, OPCR, where private citizens and residents can submit complaints through OPCR are there issues with it? Absolutely, there are issues collectively with both accountability and the police department, as well as our bureaucratic process that we need to improve in terms of timeline, efficiency, and then results. We own that. Second, as I mentioned to Council Member Payne, there's an audit function where uh, it actually is being bolstered, uh, where the city council has the ability to audit the actions of each respective department, whether that is the Office of Community Safety or that's the Office of Public Service. Uh, and so that will continue to take place. And third, the Charter Amendment itself explicitly identifies areas of purview for a city council, namely legislative, and areas of purview for a mayor, namely executive and operational. That is not a setup that is unique to the city of Minneapolis. That is one that they have through most every other major city in the country, including St. Paul, just across the river. Uh, so the notion that, that this whole push was set up with purely political ambitions is dead wrong. Uh, and I think the organizational chart that we've put out are being transparent and relaying to you and that you ultimately will vote yes or no on shows that. Thank you. Oh, I have another question. In regards to that, I want to clarify too, my question boiled down to actually the, I think you got at it at the last point of making sure this structure supports the functions of the legislative body as well as the executive and doesn't, um, it helps prevent when they start to cross. Um, so I think you got to at that a little bit towards the end. Um, and then also building upon Council Member Payne's question around uh, the Office of Community Safety, specifically looking at public safety. And I do want to take a moment to level set around that uh, to make sure that we're all working with the same information. So I know your office started off the year with a public safety work group. And as far as I'm aware, that group has not come back with any form of proposals or recommendations we also currently do not have a police chief. Um, there is gonna be a Department of Human Rights uh, report on MPD that's gonna be released from the state tomorrow. We have a federal Department of Justice investigation coming in a couple of months, both of which will outline specifically the charge of your office in carrying out work to restructure MPD and to rebuild the public trust in that institution. So that said, I'm interested to know where did your proposal for the Office of Community Safety come from? The Office of Community Safety is one that I have long embraced because I believe in an integrated approach to public safety. Uh, I believe that a 911 should not only have response from police officers. This is something that I have said before the election, during the election, I'm continuing to say now. Uh, that message has not changed. What I did not support as part of question two was this notion of having the head of that new department report to 14 different individuals, 13 council members and the mayor. And so that is not part of my proposal, not to mention we wouldn't be able to put that in the proposal even if we wanted to because question one passed and question two did not. Now, most notably, uh, as we move forward with implementation here, uh, this was based not on the individuals that had the ideas, but of the merit of the ideas. We've got to get away from this concept where we oppose something simply because the person of the person that is pushing the idea to begin with. I think the concept of integrating public safety is an excellent one. 
That's why we're doing this, and I'll tell you, we need to have an Office of Community Safety because it is very difficult for any one individual, call them a mayor or otherwise, to manage all of those different functions simultaneously to ensure accountability, to ensure safety, and to have a multifaceted response from everything from violence interrupters to police officers. I believe strongly in an integrated system and in getting to an integrated system, we gotta do it right. That's what setting up these work groups are all about. Uh, and that's what making sure we've got a broad and comprehensive a process across the part de across the city where we can analyze all the data and then implement the best possible policies. So hearing correctly, thank you so much for your answer in terms of this is coming from you taking some reflection off of the past year's discussion around the future of public safety and making kind of a personal uh, kind of moment to say this is the next step forward. Um, Cause I want to also be clear again this is coming with no data before us, no independent analysis, and no external validation from some of the groups that I named the Public Safety Work Group. So I'm excited that we can move forward with a new set of priorities around public safety, but again, really want to get the, the depth of where did this proposal come from, considering those factors are not in existence. But um, I'm really- Council Member, uh, do you want to answer yes. the question there? Or do you, do, would you, no, I'm happy to answer the question as well. No, I want to make sure I was hearing well. you correctly on that, that this is not, coming from those sources of validation. Uh, Council member, you implied that there has been some form of personal reflection that has led me to a conclusion in the past few months that suddenly we should have an integrated approach and that that wasn't my position before. The record will show that that is false. Mm. Um, I have favored an integrated approach for quite some time. Uh, I have said that to council members, I've said that to the press, I've said that both publicly and privately, and I'm continuing now to say that in public right now. And I think that we shouldn't simply abandon things that we push for during an election only because other people have now adopted those plans. Uh, I think a, a good plan should be a good plan. Let's unite on the 90% of things we agree with rather than sit back in our corners and argue about the 10% things percent of things that we don't. All right, then. Thank you for that. Thank, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments um, on this part of the discussion? I think that a lot of council members' um, questions about oversight and different pieces are covered in the next presentation on the legislative side. Um, this is about the executive structure. That's right. I'm not seeing any. So I will direct the clerk to please file this report. And we will move on to our next item, which is a report with recommendations for the establishment of a robust legislative department pursuant to Charter Amendment Number 184. And I will invite Mr. Casey Carl, our city clerk, to give the presentation on that item. Welcome, Mr. Clerk. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, as noted, uh, this presentation is about creating a legislative department. As we implement the new government structure that voters approved this past November, uh, I am joined for the presentation by our internal audit director, Ryan Patrick, uh, who will share with uh, me the microphone and, and present part of this information to you. I want to appreciate the hour and your endurance today. Um, this is the first time we've had in public to present about the legislative department. So with your indulgence and patience, we will move as quickly as possible, but it is a fairly robust uh, presentation. As you're aware, uh, after the proposed charter amendment about government structure was adopted last year, Council directed the clerk and the auditor to research other jurisdictions with comparable structures and to report back recommendations about how Council might structure its own legislative department to support its needs. So as a starting point, we wanted to be clear on defining the official functions of Council. Uh, since that was the scope of our analysis. So as we move forward with the presentation, you'll note that we do not address some of the existing core functions within the department, specifically those within the clerk's office, uh, such as elections and information governance. These functions, although a major function uh, or focus of the clerk's office, do not tie directly to the council, uh, and so we have not addressed them in this presentation. As shown on this slide, We've organized council's functions into three basic categories. Uh, those are first, policy making, second, oversight, and three, representation. 
Policy making refers to the enactment of local laws to govern the community, as well as the adoption of policies to direct the city enterprise. This is perhaps the most visible of council's official functions and possibly the one that most would easily identify as being core to a legislative body. Oversight is very closely related to policy making. Oversight involves monitoring and evaluating the work of the city government, its performance against established goals and operations within the policy parameters and limitations set by the council. Where policy making is prospective, oversight is generally more retrospective. Oversight can lead to future fine tuning in the policy framework within which the administration operates. So policy making and oversight do go hand in hand for the council. Uh, but the true bread and butter, of course, of council is most likely the work that it performs both as a body and certainly uh, the work undertaken by individual members in terms of representing the needs, the priorities, and the preferences of the many communities which collectively constitute the city of Minneapolis. Uh, noted political scientist Alan Rosenthal dedicated his professional life to the study of legislative bodies and legislative institutions, and he developed the model of what he called a good legislature. And while not specifically aimed at municipal governments, many of the points in his model can be applied to local legislative bodies like the council, especially in government structures that have separate executive and legislative branches like Minneapolis. Uh, according to Professor Rosenthal, the good legislature is effective at performing three fundamental functions. First, the good legislature balances power with the executive. In a system of shared powers, the legislature is a separate but co-equal branch of government. It takes the lead by creating the part of government that operates, that is, its officers, its departments and divisions. It raises and allocates the funds necessary to operate government and to deliver its services, and finally, it sets the goals, priorities, and the desired outcomes government is to achieve. It is the council that, through its ordinances, determines our organizational structure of the city administration. That power is both statutory and is found in city charter, specifically section 7.2. It is the council that has the authority to raise taxes, to issue debt, to authorize the payment of claims and bills, to allocate funding amongst the city's departments, and to approve certain capital investments and improvements, all found in Article 9 of the Charter. In fact, like most legislative bodies, council holds the ultimate power of the purse and has the final say on all issues of municipal finance. And finally, it is the council, in collaboration with the mayor, that identifies and sets the city's strategic goals and priorities, its operating policies, and the outcomes that are to be achieved for the community and its residents. Second, the good legislature represents constituents. Rosenthal believed that representation was the legislature's most important function, based on his uh, comparable analyses of legislative bodies across the world. Through their elections, members of the legislative body serve as the proxy of the people. It's their responsibility to give voice to the needs and the priorities of their constituents and to ensure the community has the opportunity to monitor and, where appropriate, participate in governance functions. These observations are equally true and applicable to the Minneapolis City Council. And finally, the good legislature makes law. As the city's legislative body, it's the council vested with the authority to make law to govern our community. As an extension of that authority, council is obligated to ensure that its legislative process provides an open, accessible, and deliberative mean to identify and articulate issues, to develop proposals to address those issues, and to shepherd proposals through the process that lead to the enactment of local laws. Rosenthal claimed that a fair, effective, and open legislative process must ensure that a diversity of perspectives and interests are balanced in the deliberation of any proposals, and that there is a structured give and take and an exchange of information so that individual legislators are able to build consensus on shared values that then can be translated into law. To be effective at performing these core functions, Rosenthal concluded that the good legislature must have institutional capacity and resources to perform its official functions. And this requires a reasonable level of independence from the executive so that the legislative body is able to perform as a fully equal partner in governing. 
Based on Professor Rosenthal's work, criteria were developed to evaluate how well a legislative body performs, some of which are shown on this slide. So for example, does the legislature as a body effectively share power with the executive? Is there clarity around the core responsibilities, the functions, the authority of the legislative body vis-a-vis -vis its relationship with the executive? Does the legislature have the capacity to initiate and to enact its own legislation and to make independent decisions about the budget? This would include independent access to information, data analysis and contextualization, research and reference services, legislative drafting, and the ability to monitor and evaluate performance. Is the legislature's decision-making process open, transparent, and accessible to residents, interest groups, advocates, and the media? Are there meaningful opportunities to participate in its decision-making? Does that process allow for a healthy give and take and the open exchange of ideas and information at all stages of the process, both formal and informal? Does the legislature provide effective civic education about representative democracy, the legislative institution, and about lawmaking processes? Do members provide effective constituent services? And finally, does the legislature as an institution have the independent dedicated resources necessary to enable it as a body to perform its official functions. Again, if the legislative body is to be more than a rubber stamp to the executive, it requires access to its own independent resources to support its functions. These criteria then informed our thinking about how to structure and resource a legislative department so that it would be capable of supporting a good council. This slide shows the jurisdictions that were included in our analysis. Uh, the common characteristics here are that all of them operate under a strong mayor system comparable to what voters adopted for Minneapolis. Council members in all of these cities serve in a full-time capacity and operate with a system of standing committees. And the councils in these jurisdictions all have independent, dedicated resources to support their work. It's important to remember, of course, that no two jurisdictions are exactly alike, nor are they organized in the exact same way. Even those which operate under a similar structure can be, and most often are, very different in terms of their operations. Those differences account for things such as variations in state laws which structure and empower local government, the economy and economic drivers of different regions in the nation, population, political priorities and needs, culture in the broadest definition, and more. And certainly, while these jurisdictions that we've shown here uh, do share features in common with Minneapolis, all of them also have unique aspects that create significant differences from what is currently in place here and what might be considered for our specific jurisdiction. But all of them do provide interesting comparisons, and we have identified ideas that could be incorporated here that we believe would benefit the council and, by extension, the enterprise and the community. This slide shows the overall legislative department as we envision it, both in terms of what is already created under the city charter, as well as encompassing the recommendations we'll be presenting today. The major components of the department include, as you can see, the city council, which is the city's legislative body defined under Article 4 of the charter, the city clerk, who is the clerk and parliamentarian of the council, and the city auditor, which is a newly created position in the charter intended to serve as a professional advisor as well as an objective evaluator of enterprise performance. As shown here, you can see that our recommendations would provide enhancements and new programming in the offices of clerk and auditor aligned with efforts to professionalize and institutionalize resources for the long-term benefit of council as a body. We'll review each of those at a high level first, and then we'll dig into each of the recommendations in more detail after providing the introduction. And in particular, we'll wanna give special attention to the city auditor. As I mentioned, it is a new position mandated under the charter and a new division under that office of city auditor of legislative and budget analysis. So as I said, we'll explore each of these in the next few slides at a higher level. Here you can see we're showing ward offices. The ward offices support each of the 13 council members. This slide shows that the ward office is the base of operations for each council member and it supports their work with a number of audiences. The ward office includes two aides, each of whom are appointed by the council member. The ward offices primarily support representative functions, but they also contribute to the functions of the council members in terms of their performance as members of this body and in their committee assignments. 
Here you can see the clerk's office. The clerk's office provides institutional support for the council. It is the permanent staff of the body, and it ensures continuity between elections. The clerk's office is the secretariat of council and its committees, and it focuses on meeting management functions, the certification and publication of official acts, and the publication and maintenance of the city charter and code of ordinances. In addition to its legislative and policy support functions, the clerk's office handles the daily operations of the department, which includes, amongst other things, financial management, personnel administration, and information systems and technology support. In addition to these existing functions, the proposed investments as part of a new legislative department would create two new units, which we've shown here in blue. First, a legislative drafting unit that would provide council and its committees with professional, nonpartisan legislative research, reference, and drafting services. This unit would assume primary responsibility for the preparation of ordinances and resolutions, motions, amendments, and other legislative products. It would also take responsibility for the future management of codification functions. The members of this unit would function as liaisons with the city attorney's office in the preparation and processing of those official acts and would interact with all departments in terms of supporting the legislative and policy work of council and its committees. If policymaking is the council's primary function under the new government structure, then having a professional unit of employees with the requisite education, experience, and expertise to support that work would be a priority investment. Second, an outreach and constituent services unit is proposed that would provide council and its members, as well as the entire legislative department, with professional support and resources to engage, educate, inform, and connect with constituents and the community at large. This unit would provide outreach programs, coordinate communications, and handle special projects, all focused on building awareness about the work of the council and how it is relevant to the lives of constituents. This unit would act as liaisons with other parts of the enterprise that share a similar focus on the community, for example, but not to be limited to, the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department, City Communications, 311, and the Service Desk. So again, we'll dig into the details of these two proposed units in a minute, but first I want to recognize my partner, our Audit Director, Ryan Patrick, to talk about the Auditor's Office first. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Carl. Uh, good afternoon, Council President, uh, Committee Chair. My name is Ryan Patrick. I'm the Internal Audit Director. I'm going to talk pretty briefly now about what we currently offer, and that is in our Internal Audit Department, the current audit function remains unchanged. Offering assurance and compliance services, consultations, we do perform an oversight mechanism, working with departments on a risk-based evaluation system to ensure that operations are carried out in a healthy manner and, and that the city is effectively managing its risk. Uh, the additional units that we're talking about today in proposed and um, additions to the city auditor's office would include legislative and policy analysis along with uh, business and operational analysis. So these would be additional professional resources assigned to council to help inform them during the policymaking process and this kind of wraparound service of policymaking and oversight falling underneath the office of the city auditor. Mr. Carl. So that's a high level introduction to the three major units within the legislative department, some of the high level recommendations we've made. Now we're gonna go into each one of those in a little bit more detail. Uh, wanna review those recommendations uh, in structure. This graphic that's in front of you now, we're gonna repeat on the following slides just to help orient us so we know where we are. Uh, throughout the presentation, we'll start with the ward offices. Uh, so our proposal does not include any changes to ward offices from how they're currently structured or staffed. Each ward office would continue to have uh, the authority to have two aides appointed by the council member. The ward offices would continue to primarily focus on supporting representative functions as well as providing personal assistance to individual council members. I'll note that, <clears throat> however, based on research of comparable jurisdictions, I've already connected with our human resources department about some options we might want to consider that would allow, in my opinion, for greater flexibility to design uh, ward offices around council members' needs in the future. And while that work has not begun officially in earnest, I believe that the ideas we've gathered from other jurisdictions 
uh, as I said, would help give council members more flexibility in tailoring their ward offices to best meet their own needs, recognizing that each ward is unique and have different needs and circumstances. And so I would anticipate likely we'd have more information to share with council about those options and how we might consider them next year. But at this point, there's no change proposed. Mr. Carl, did you want to get through your whole presentation before you entertain questions, or would you like me to interrupt you as we go along? Might be helpful to get through the whole thing as quickly as possible. That would be great. There's 24 and we're on 11. So as I said, here's the Office of City Clerk. This proposed uh, includes the creation of the new Legislative Council unit that I've already described. Uh, I don't need to spend a whole lot of time if the council uh, doesn't need that. This unit is proposed to include a Legislative Council and two Assistant Legislative Councils that, as I mentioned, uh, functioning sort of like a revisor of statutes office at the state level would be responsible for providing uh, legislative drafting research and reference services for council and its committees and would be responsible for publishing and maintaining the charter and code of ordinances. On the right of the screen, you can see the Secretariat unit a unit. This ex unit already exists. This is primarily the clerks who staff the council and its committees uh, proposing to add one indexing clerk to this uh, unit going forward. We used to have three indexing clerks when I first came to the city in 2010. Uh, we now have none. Uh, we were using those existing positions when they became vacant to reclassify for more pressing needs, but the indexing clerk does perform work that is mission critical to the office of the city clerk. Um, they function sort of as reference librarians. Every single act that's approved by the council has to be fully indexed, it has to be tagged, it's published, it's filed. They're also the team that does the research and polls uh, when requested by council, by committees, by departments, um, and cross-reference those things. So the indexing clerk becomes an essential function for our go forward in the clerk's office. On this slide, you can see uh, two new divisions or one existing division operations and a new proposed team in the clerk's office for outreach and constituent services. In the operations field, this is the small team we have that manages our day-to-day -day administrative functions in the department, so that includes budget and financial management, personnel administration, payroll, uh, information technology, and other resource coordinating functions. It also provides administrative support to council, so this is the people who staff the reception area and provide supplemental administrative support to the ward offices. Proposing here to add a new position for a director of administration as we uh, not only take care of 13 ward offices and the three divisions of the clerk's office, but also add the new Office of City Auditor. These functions are primarily um, led by me personally, and it feels uh, that we need a director of administration to take on those functions and lead them across the entire department. The outreach and constituent services team, as I mentioned, is completely new. This would bring in a professional team to provide support for the council's outreach, communications, constituent services, and special project functions. You can see we're looking to add a total of uh, five people here, uh, a manager, and then some team members. This then shows you the total uh, clerk's office uh, with the investments shown that I've highlighted very rapidly. Uh, in the various divisions under the clerk's office that we're proposing. Of course, we're not proposing to add these all at once. This is a lot of investment to make at one time. Uh, the auditor and I have tried to work in consideration of enterprise-wide needs. Uh, and so at the end, you'll see we do have a timeline that proposes over multiple years uh, the addition of the various staff that we are proposing. I believe the next slide takes us to the city auditor. Yep, so I'll stand down. Thank you, Mr. Carl. So the city auditor under the new charter amendment is a new position. There's no incumbent and there's current work ongoing. Uh, Mr. Carl is working with HR to create the position of city auditor. It doesn't currently exist. I am the internal audit director. It's a different position. Uh, so that's one of the first major changes. One of the other major changes that happened uh, via question one is that the audit committee is no longer made up a majority council. It is now required to have a balance uh, tilted more in favor of community than council. So people are appointed by council, but no longer a majority elected body. So that's a change that will need to happen in the future with the audit committee. Uh, under this proposal, the city auditor will lead these two separate unique divisions, the internal audit function, which is the one that you currently have and, and work with reporting to the audit committee, uh, and the Legislative and Business Analysis Division, which I'm going to discuss in detail in the coming sides. But the first new position under the, the Charter Amendment 
would be the city auditor position. Uh, we are designing this process to provide real wraparound services in the realm of oversight and policy making. Uh, one on the right side is the one, uh, the oversight mission, the, the process improvement mission that we have in audit. The left is analysis, uh, that's the more proactive vision, that's, that's the uh, body that's a supporting council. And really what lies in the middle is the information that both sides share. Uh, that's work with a lot of different uh, units around the enterprise, but it's audit highlighting the risks and opportunities and needs for changes that may happen at the legislative level. And then analysis, tying goals, outcome costs, uh, policies uh, to legislation that we can then evaluate and use as kind of the uh, bedrock of how we do our audit work. So it's a complete uh, wraparound process. Uh, these are the new positions uh, under the new um, division in the city auditor's office. Two really, really important parts. So first, the legislative analysts. As you do your work, your policymaking work, uh, you deserve free uh, access to nonpartisan, unbiased information to support you in your policymaking decisions. We in audit enjoy a level of independence that no other city department has because we report to an audit committee uh, that's who kind of hires and, and um, monitors our work. People who report to the city auditor enjoy that same level of independence at the same time as having free, full, and unrestricted access to information across the enterprise to do its business. Legislative analysts working with the city auditor's office would, at direction of council, conduct research on behalf of council during their policymaking uh, duties. They're free because of the independence portion, leveraging the independence of the city auditor's office. They are free to bring back that non-biased uh, information and essentially deliver good and bad news without fear of any type of reprisal or being tied too directly to one uh, council member or one position. So these legislative analysts are professionals who work in the policymaking process who can do research and report back neutral facts that, um, that can help aid in legislation. They're not there to tell people what to do or what not to do. This is an information neutral process. Similarly, the financial analysts lead an important role in tying costs to activities. So what are the costs associated with policymaking, the policies that are proposed, enterprise actions? The fiscal analysts are, are those specialists who can do that, who can tie the dollars and cents to the actions that the city's taking. Quite critically, one of the most important roles council has is the review of the mayor's budget and, and the work with the mayor's budget. The financial analysts would help lead that process. You'd have access to, again, nonpartisan independent researchers with expertise in the subject who could help lead and, and provide you analytical, analytical work throughout that process. I'd say one thing uh, that those people are not doing is redesigning the budget, redoing the budget. They are here to provide that research and foundation for you as you see fit and as you need as you do your work. So internal audit remains unchanged, and it's, I think, very important and really critical that this is a firewalled off process reporting to the audit committee continuing in its current form. We know that this is a really critical measure of oversight for the city, that it remains such, uh, and, and will continue to operate in its current form. However, we know that there's a high demand right now for audit work and audit services in the realm of public safety operations. We're taking a broad view of public safety, not just police department, not just 911, uh, a more holistic view of public safety. And based on the amount of risk that exists in the public safety sphere, we think it's important to add dedicated resources to the internal audit team to address those issues specifically. Uh, this proposal also calls for the addition of those public safety auditors who would be assigned specifically as subject matter experts to work on public safety audit work. Uh, this is the high-level chart, and I, I'd say also that this is aspirational. Part of this new design of a new process, adding new resources for council, you're the consumers of this information. You are the product, uh, the receivers of the product, and also the process owners. So the design of this is going to hinge a lot on what your needs are, and that's something that we're going to need to work on and figure out over the coming years. This isn't going to happen overnight. Uh, if you look at that, we'll see the following slide that has a rough outline and timeline of where we plan to be or potential path over the next several years. But I think, again, this represents that high-level view in the future of what the Office of the City Auditor could look like. 
this being the proposed implement, implementation timeline. And I uh, walked you through the 2022 through 2025 potentials for the city auditor's office. I can turn it back over to Mr. Carl to discuss uh, the office of the city clerk timeline. Thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna keep going. We've covered both sides, clerk and auditor. This is just a summary chart that tries to then wrap that up and show the relationship between the executive branch that we've spent time on now in several meetings of this subcommittee and now the first time on the legislative branch, how the mayor and the council balance each other. The council is responsible, as we mentioned, for three functions, policy making, oversight, and representation, and the resources needed to do that work. The mayor as the CEO of the city or chief executive officer now responsible for implementation of the council's policy, for enforcement of its rules, and for the administration of the government and its performance. And so hopefully that attempts to show uh, the connection between, between the two major branches. Yep. Your microphone. Microphone. Mr. Clerk, uh, Councilman Ellison does need to make a comment before he leaves as he is leaving right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, thank you, Mr. Clark, uh, Mr. Carl. Um, just wanted to uh, say thank you both. I know you guys are halfway through your presentation, but had a, I've had a chance to, to speak to you. I've had a chance to speak to a lot of my colleagues and, and look forward to, to this discussion um, as, we, as, we, as we shape our government and what it looks like. Um, but I, uh, I do have to go and I didn't wanna just get up and, and waltz out in the middle of the presentation. Um, it's really thorough. I, I hope that we are gonna take every bit of, uh, of care to craft the legislative side. As we've seen, there's a lot of, a lot of detail on the, on the, on the executive side. Um, uh, uh, but the, the purpose is to have executive and legislative sides of the government uh, and, and not for us to just sort of defer our role. So I uh, just wanted to, to leave you all with that and to, and to thank the clerk uh, and the auditor for, for this presentation um, and apologize for having to go to an event in my ward um, uh, for some service providers who are, who are doing something there regarding homelessness, so still topical to, to our community today. So thank you all, and um, thanks again. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I would just say the next two slides talk about next steps. Uh, so we are near completion. Uh, with respect to the legislative department, today certainly felt very rushed. And I know that we need to build consensus on the body. So we're not asking for specific actions at this point. We're simply presenting for the first time our proposal to you. Um, we want to work with council members to finalize the scope and the design of the legislative department. As Mr. Patrick, I think, so, said very well, this is a uh, a proposal uh, that we believe is grounded in um, good principles and we think it is a measured and long-term plan that can benefit the council in its work. Uh, with the council's continued input, we would finalize the scope and design for that department and then would return with more details about that uh, in future meetings. Tied to step two, we think it would be helpful and healthy for the body to merge further considerations of anything on the executive side with the legislative side so that these are a balanced and holistic consideration and not sort of consideration of one side uh, against the other. So thinking that as we reach that concurrence or agreement, we would bring forward um, any future uh, proposals and considerations together holistically that we would identify and track all of the necessary actions to expedite implementation whether that means charter amendments or code amendments and that staff would have a comprehensive timeline for future actions that are necessary to create and maintain and even share information about updates with policymakers and with the public so that completes our presentation. Uh, happy to stand for questions if there are any. As I mentioned, not really asking for specific direction today. Might be good to queue up a follow-up conversation given the hour and the way the day has progressed. Thank you. There are a couple of questions or comments in queue. I'll start with Councilmember Vita. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a couple questions for um, Clerk Carl and also uh, Director Patrick, I'll start with you, Mr. Clerk, since you're first. Um, my first question is, how would the centralized team you're proposing interact with our ward offices and aides, and how do you see this helping improve our ability to serve our constituents? Uh, 
Madam Chair and to Councilmember Vita's uh, question. I, I think that the staff, the centralized staff we're proposing would supplement and bolster the work that your aides are doing. And so that it would provide continuity over time between elections and a consistent level of service so that residents can come to rely on a certain level or standard of service being delivered by the legislative branch, certainly led by the council member and, its, and their ward offices, their aides, but then supported by the staff that we've outlined in this presentation. So I think it's a sort of both and, if I can use that term, approach. It's uh, both being led by council members and their aides and supported by the centralized team. Thank you. And then my last question for you is, you've called for an outreach team. Uh, what specific functions does that include? So um, outreach, uh, Madam Chair, through the chair, uh, outreach is a very awkward term. I'm, I'm open to calling it something different. Um, we have a position called Voter Outreach and Education in our Elections and Voter Services Division in the Clerk's Office. Um, and so that was the jumping off point for me is, is, is um, leveraging that experience. That position has been responsible for really providing voter education, information, engagement opportunities, um, talking about the voting process and getting people excited about each election. Uh, and for, from my perspective, that type of function is what that new unit would do, that, that new unit of outreach and constituent services more broadly on the council and its committees with respect to legislative and policy making work, but also in terms of opportunities to engage and participate. Uh, so professional communications, outreaching into the community from the legislative department, opportunities to participate, structuring those up, whether that's um, ward uh, forums, uh, your newsletters, things like that. So bringing in those professional resources that help us do that connectivity work between the council, the department, and the community. Thank you. Council Member Wansley Warlaba. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wait, I, I oh, apologize. Okay. <laughs> the second, I I'm there. sorry. The second piece of this was for Director Patrick. Yes, sorry. thank you so much. Thank you, Director Patrick, for remembering you were next. <laughs> <laughs> I had to sit there and wait until I heard what the question was. <laughs> okay, my first question is, uh, the police department recently posted for two new law enforcement auditor positions. How do the recommendations for public safety auditors as a part of the city auditor's office relate to those positions and are those duplicate functions and how are those positions distinct and different, if at all? Uh, Chair Palmasano, committee member Vita, thank you for that question. Uh, first off, internal audit is the department in the city that conducts audit work. So we, we abide by the international standards for the professional practice of auditing. It's aligned. We are the ones who perform audit work. So the law enforcement auditors, as I understand them in MPD, um, I don't want to speak for how they're going to function, but they will do internal analysis work, which is pretty different from an external body doing that evaluative and oversight function. Uh, more importantly, though, we are, as a city, thinking about public safety as uh, through a broader lens than simply just the police department. And the public safety auditors that I've proposed in this, in this outline address the entirety of the public safety apparatus. So they're not limited to just law enforcement operations, although they do represent a very high risk activity the city engages in, and therefore will get, um, certainly be a subject of analysis for these public safety auditors. But we're looking at those public safety auditors broadly as supporting the entirety of the public safety operations in the city and not just the police department. I could see them uh, working in tandem with people who work inside departments as we, we commonly do. We, we share work, we, we share information and whatnot, but internal audit is that independent body that exists outside of the city structure that you won't find anywhere else internally in a department. That function just can't simply exist in the same way or be performed using the same techniques. Thank you. So how would the addition of these powers help the council to regulate and oversee all public safety functions, including police, when there is such a division between the mayor and the council um, in terms of who is accountable for operations? Thank you. Internal audit, we design our audit plan based on risk. And so we are constantly evaluating the city's operations, what, what are deemed high risk, and we're doing our oversight work or our audit work based on that uh, calculation. That work is 
occurs independently and, and using our standards and it is reported back up to the audit committee and any other policymaker who wants to receive that information. So how, how does internal audit supplement you know, the executive side functions of overseeing their, their own work? Well, if the council deems inactivity high risk and suggests to the audit committee and the auditor that an item be included on the audit plan, the internal auditor has the free, full, and unrestricted access to information to conduct any type of oversight work that's necessary there, as long as we deem it based on risk and that it fits into what would be considered a proper audit under the standard. So uh, it is an extension, an oversight and extension, and um, kind of a quality control extension that the, the city council enjoys via its independence through the audit committee. The second part to that question is, could this actually help the council provide policy level direction and control, even in terms of police accountability? And can you describe your vision in that regard, please? Thank you, that's, that's a great question. So when an audit concludes, we may have findings uh, that come out of an audit. So we may, we may state that in an audit, this area of operations is not happening in a healthy way. Um, obviously, it's far more detailed in the report and supported by evidence and, and um, the analysis that we do. And uh, part of what is required uh, back from the audit client is a management action plan. So what are you as a manager going to do to address the deficiency that we've, we've located as a part of this audit? Or are you going to simply continue to engage in the risky activity and change nothing? Well, sometimes audit findings require policy work and policy making to address the underlying risks. So if a policy is deficient or there's an enterprise impact, it's absolutely critical that policymakers kind of pick up the mantle there and run with it. The audit shop doesn't, we don't come up with the policy for the department. It's up to the policymakers and the people involved to, to come up with their own and remediate the solutions. We then validate it at the end of the process stating that yes, the actions that were taken did solve the problem. So that's that's the loop right there between the auditor's office and I think the council is in the realm of when there is policy and legislation needed to address audit findings in a report. That's a, that's a feedback loop that needs to exist and I see being bolstered significantly under the new charter amendment. And my last question, how does this work differ from the work of the Office of Police Conduct Review or the Police Conduct Oversight Commission? Uh, th this work supplements the work of the Office of Police Conduct Review, although I'd state Office of Police Conduct Review investigates complaints. That's a big part of their missions. So that's one distinct sphere that they do, internal audit does not. Um, the Police Conduct Oversight Commission does research and study work, and I don't want to, I don't want to speak for them. They have their own actions and responsibilities, um, but they do research and study work that in a lot of ways looks like audit work. It can be uh, rapidly adapted to an evolving situation. Um, it can occur quickly, whereas in audit, we build out an annual risk-based audit plan and execute it um, under the direction of the, of the audit committee. So it's, the work has similarities, but audit, again, because of its independence and the way we do it, is designed to achieve different results than perhaps what the Police Conduct Oversight Commission or the Office of Police Conduct Review would do. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next is Councilmember Wansley Warlaba. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just have uh, two questions. Uh, Clerk Carl or uh, Patrick um, would love to know, uh, is there a status on where AREA um, is in regards to this proposal? Madam Chair, the I just want to clarify, we're talking about the race equity impact mm -hmm. analysis. So there's been no race equity impact analysis at this point because this is simply a proposal on personnel and investments. As we move forward to make those changes, um, the RIA is required as part of an ordinance that makes changes. And so the fiscal note and analysis, the race equity impact analysis, those things are yet to come after we reach consensus with the body on what direction we want to go. So we haven't really done a RIA at this point um, or a race equity impact analysis, but would anticipate doing so as, as we gain consensus on a direction. Is there any way, just thinking of the earlier presentation that we received from the mayor's office, where there is going to be, I think, an implementation group that is charged with doing a race and equity analysis and is still in a proposal phase, if we can also bump that timeline up uh, on the legislative side? Madam Chair, Councilmember mm -hmm. Wansley-Worlove, I agree with you, which is mm -hmm. why, um, and perhaps I wasn't 
uh, more forceful in this piece. This presentation was our first time to talk about the legislative branch. It, it, lots of reasons didn't go necessarily as, as timely as we'd hoped. I think we need another presentation, but I'm hopeful that the council will agree that going forward we shouldn't have separate presentations, we should meld them together such that all of those analyses are being done holistically so that the fiscal impact is not just on the executive branch or just on our branch, it's holistically about what is the fiscal impact of the entire government structure change. The race equity impact analysis is done on the whole thing. So I, I think I'm saying the same thing you are, which is mm -hmm. let's move those together such that the council mm -hmm. has the benefit of all of those analyses together before it starts making decisions. Got you. And this kind of relates to my second question, too, as we want to look at all of this information as a whole, mm -hmm. um, in part to get to that point, doing a lot of information gathering. So, you know, my office has been in touch about, you know, my predecessor, Cam Gordon, um, leaving or getting $90,000 towards doing an independent a research consultation project on the legislative option um, and wanted to see what is the status um, of that RFP. We've been in touch, haven't heard anything, and I think it would be a good opportunity for us to get another source of information or another analysis of this. Um, we know this is going to greatly shape our ability to do our work for our constituents or on behalf of our constituents. And while I think it's great our initial proposal looks at Duluth, San Diego, uh, and St. Paul, um, they are not experiencing some of the same challenges that we're experiencing here and to get a broader perspective. So we'd love to know what's the status of that RFP. Madam Chair, Councilmember Wansley Worlaba, just to correct the statement, money was put into the clerk's budget to support the structural um, realignment with what voters directed. There was no specific direction on RFP, uh, professional consultants. It was money given to support the process of transition and restructuring, and we are using that money. Um, internally, we have hired additional people to support that work uh, internally. Uh, in terms of the work teams that the mayors identified, the process that the auditor and clerk are working on, so that as we move forward on those teams, we have additional support. We have staff who are who are contributing to the work of, of making recommendations and implementing the government restructure, but they have other jobs to do. And so having dedicated resources that come in here and help support that specific structure of work is where we're using the, the funding that was reallocated. Okay, and I can go back and look, but from my understanding and conversations with the former council member, it was more specifically of getting an independent. So I think there was one uh, former council member, Lisa Bender, asked for internal movement or analysis on this. I think former council member Gordon also wanted to move resources to look at an independent analysis. So you're saying the independent component or resources are also being used to support the internal analyses that you all are carrying out right now and that we're going to review. Uh, Madam Chair, that's correct. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure uh, that the former council member uh, made that clarity in the motion that certainly was not recorded. Um, the only official direction with respect to the legislative branch that was adopted by the council uh, and approved is the direction to the auditor and the clerk to, to go research other cities. Um, certainly you'll notice in our list, we didn't look at Duluth and St. Paul. Um, we looked at Seattle and Denver and Milwaukee and, and much bigger cities that we think are more aligned with uh, Minneapolis and what we're experiencing here in Minneapolis. Uh, the monies that were put in at the last minute during the budget uh, amendment by former council member Gordon mm -hmm. uh, were to support the work and give the council its, its, uh, its funding. And so we have that funding. We've chosen to, to use that to support the work that's already been underway since uh, November 19th when those staff directions were first given. So um, I'm sorry if there's been a misunderstanding along that line, but we are using those funds to support the work that is already underway and has been underway uh, to, to put together plans and proposals and ultimately to do these analyses that we started discussing uh, because we'll need extra support for that work as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Member Koski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a few questions for both of you. Uh, <coughs> City Clerk Casey Krell. First, thank you so much for this detailed uh, presentation and all the hard work that you've done in supporting the council in this restructure process. I'm, I'm grateful. Um, so my questions are in response to the portion of the presentation that was about the legislative council. So I've, I've heard some concerns about this creating conflict with the city attorney's charter functions. Um, how do you see you yourself addressing um, those concerns and potential conflicts? 
uh, Madam Chair, Councilmember Koski, I think that uh, the ability to have independent resources that build the capacity of the council to do its work um, do not impact necessarily the work of the city attorney, but recognize that the city attorney under our charter has a very unique role. Um, the city attorney is named by the charter as the attorney of the city. That means they are the attorney of the mayor, they are the attorney of the council, they are the attorney of every department, every officer of the city with the notable exception of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Um, notwithstanding that, there are attorneys embedded throughout the city in different departments that have a heavy need of expertise. And I think that there's a model at the state that we could certainly look at. The state, for example, has an attorney general. The attorney general is the attorney of the state. Um, but the legislature has the reviser of statutes, which is a group of professionals who help the legislature do its work. Um, the secretary of state, I know this, uh, in terms of my work with elections has an attorney, but the attorney of the Secretary of State is still the Attorney General. So the process you have to do is very clearly delineate where a legislative council role begins and ends um, and how it intersects, in my opinion, with the city attorney's office. And one of the most important pieces of that is the check that the city attorney, so we talked earlier about checks and balances, the city attorney has a huge check on anything that goes forward. You can certainly delegate drafting to someone else. In fact, most of our departments do the drafting. It's not the attorneys who draft it, the departments draft it. And then it goes to the attorney's office for that you know, seal of approval that it's been um, approved as to form, a legal uh, term of art that simply means the attorneys have looked at it, they've made sure there's no conflict with existing law, that it is within the authority of the city government delegated by the state under our charter, and similar things. So in a similar fashion, we're simply talking about realigning that work under resources that are aligned with and directly responsive to the council to enable it to do its work independently. But any final work product would always have to go to the city attorney for a, a final check, for um, a quality assurance, uh, a legal analysis, things like that. So I think that uh, while I recognize there are concerns, I think there are ways to mitigate those concerns and we certainly have a model across the river at the state that we can look to. Uh, thanks. What, so what would be the biggest drawback if we did not have our own team, in your opinion? Uh, Madam Chair, Councilman Burkowski, I think that the potential drawback, the biggest potential drawback is that when council wants to initiate its own legislation, it doesn't have its own resources. Um, structurally, you would be reliant on the executive to support your work. Uh, so when we talked about those criteria about a good legislature, and it says that a good legislature or a good council has the ability to initiate and enact its own legislation to pursue its own independent budget um, prerogatives, you wouldn't have that. Um, and so, you know, certainly the council can choose not to go down that path, um, putting it forward because I think it puts in line um, a respect for the separation of powers and gives council, if council is, uh, focused primarily on legislation and policy making. If that's the number one function of this body under the new structure, then it should have its own dedicated resources for that function. Thank you. Um, can you just Describe a little bit more in depth about how this team would work with the council and specifically our council committees too. Uh, through the chair, I think that the way it works best is if they are assigned to committees. Council works very strongly, as you know, through its committee system. Uh, departments and subject matters are divided up into the jurisdictions of the various committees. So, you know, a legislative council would be assigned with subject matter expertise to that area uh, and work very closely with the chair and the members of each committee, ultimately shepherding that work through the process to full council, uh, liaising with the city attorney's office, with other departments that are subject matter experts within that sphere of municipal policy, uh, being liaison on all matters related to the committee's work uh, within the realm of policies that the committees have that are assigned by council. And so I think they act both as process experts um, and drafters, but also as liaisons, professional liaisons on behalf of the council and its committees into the administration. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I do have a question for Director, for Director Ryan Patrick, if you don't mind. Um, but again, before diving in, I just wanna say thank you um, as well for all of your support and working on this proposal. Uh, and I look forward to continuing that collaboration. Uh, I know you and I have talked about this in conversations, but I think it'd be beneficial to, for everybody here to understand, you know, in the past two years, a lot of work we've done in the subject area that will be covered by the public safety auditor um, is reactive rather than proactive. Can you speak to how through this role we will be able to act proactively rather than reactively. Um, and 
in a little more in depth to, to that too. So. Chair Palmasano, uh, Council Member Kosky, the when you have limited resources and you're required to use those resources as an enterprise-wide function, which that's the current state of audit, we provide audit coverage for the entire city of enter enterprise. You address kind of the highest risk needs as they arise and pop up, and certainly in the realm of public safety, it's been kind of one thing after the next and the city reacting to it. If we have a proactive uh, public safety audit work group, um, a group in the audit department who collaborates with uh, people around the enterprise, who's continuously addressing risk and basing a plan and doing continuous evaluation based on those risks, you're getting out ahead of the challenges instead of responding kind of in real time because of the lack of resources in that area. Um, uh, kind of the more uh, audit works best when we're in kind of the prevention of risks from occurring phase rather than we know the risk has become reality, how do we kind of address it and really get to the root cause of why this problem happened? And so investing in those resources to kind of perform that in a continuous setting lets you be more proactive in preventing problems before they arise. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, I'm gonna have our last person in queue before we have to move on, be Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think you spoke to this actually, because uh, my original question was gonna be, you know, given that we're in a state of transition, um, we, we don't have those dedicated legislative resources. And so you, what in this state of transition under our current government structure, which has passed as a result of charter or question one passing, um, is the best way for us to um, get that independent uh, policy research so that we can actually deliver on our role as policymakers? Is it is it the staff direction? Is that kind of our, our current and only tool for our ability to do policymaking? Uh, Madam Chair, Councilmember Payne, I, I, certainly you have the ability through a staff direction or a council direction. That's the will of the body. It's been through the process. It's been approved by the right vote and it's approved by the mayor or overridden with a supermajority vote to get uh, research information analysis from the enterprise. The professional staff, I think, are well qualified to tell you how they work, how they could work better. Uh, I can share with you that I've been in several meetings since November when the question passed. Uh, internally, where staff are already talking about how could we you know, be more efficient, more effective, how can we operate better together, what are the kinds of synergies that bring our departments together. So I think there is a lot of work already within the professional ranks of the staff happening, and I think they would be happy to respond to provide the council with, with analysis and data and, and, and other contextualizations. To the extent that council wishes as a body to have other outside support, then of course there's a process where the body you know, can give that direction and say we would like this and, and then through the proper vote and process, uh, we the staff can help uh, secure uh, those resources uh, for the council. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize, colleagues. I know it has been a long afternoon. We still have some work to get through, so I will um, direct the clerk to please receive and file that report. Item number four, our final item, is the Public Safety Department Charter Amendment. This item originated in the POGO Committee, the Policy and Government Oversight Committee. It was advanced to the April 14th Council meeting and then was referred back to the Committee of the Whole, this Government Structure Subcommittee, for further discussion. My understanding is that Councilmember Wansley Warlaba has a substitute to your original motion that you'd like us to consider, so go ahead and introduce that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, all of you should have received the updated substitute motion um, that you know basically boils, boils down my original um, uh, staff directive to one key goal, which as we just had an extensive conversation on with the legislative presentation, um, basically is just to get additional information to make informed decisions about public safety. This doesn't commit us to anything. It's just a bare minimum research and analysis a request that we need to do um, often in order for us to do our jobs. I'm also very aware that uh, this morning, uh, the mayor also emailed all of us and encouraged you all to not support this staff direction. Um, but before that takes place, I also want to address a couple of things that was noted in that. 
Um, I do want to highlight with this current substitute motion um, that, you know, there's no uh, predetermined outcome um, that is made um, if we support this. Um, again, it's for us to gather information to make an informed decision by the time we have to take action on how we're going to move about creating this new Department of Public Safety. Um, and that is a core piece of our work as legislators is to get and solicit information um, even in uh, Clerk's, uh, Carl's presentation around, you know, there was a slide that said good counsel and the component of that. And one of it was being able to have a healthy give and take and an open exchange of ideas and information um, for all stages of the formal and informed uh, legislative process. This builds upon, I think, what is a clear component of good uh, legislative, uh, you know, processes. Um, I also want to note that, you know, as of now, we don't have any information about the current Office of Community Safety. We don't have data, independent analysis. Um, so there's nothing to work with there. On the legislative end with this new Department of Public Safety, we will um, be able to at least start gathering that additional data that we need before we can make an informed decision. Um, I also just want to note, too, that that email this morning was very disturbing. I don't support using political influence to stop us from getting the information that we need, especially since that's a key part of our jobs. Um, the council job is to legislate as a body, and we can only do that when we have accurate and comprehensive information. And if we are not even able to get that information, then we are unable to do our jobs. So I think at the very basis, if you believe that we should support a good legislative practice of exchanging and acquiring information so we can have all options on the table before we take up policy decisions, then I encourage you to support the substitute motion. Um, but that's all. Thank you. You um, are putting forward a substitute motion, so I should assume you're making that motion. And is there a second for that substitute motion? Second. It, that motion has been seconded. Um, for discussion, I put myself in queue. I just want to make sure that we're really clear about this record. Now I just went and opened this. I was in a settlement conference earlier today. I don't see um, political pressure. I, I, I don't I don't see the characterization, council member, that you are seeing in this. Um, it does specifically say from the mayor that he does not support your staff direction, um, and he gives his three reasons for that. But in, in his presentation just a, about an hour ago now, um, he made it clear that there are all these implementation teams that have a lot of the due diligence that you are seeking in this work, I don't think that you're misaligned in your interest in being really careful and doing a whole lot of analysis as we move forward with this, um, with these steps. So I don't think that we should be delaying the work that is already underway in these implementation teams. The voters gave us this direction in November. It's going to take a while to do this. Um, so I would prefer that we start the work uh, as previously underway. Um, and I just wanted to make that clear and correct any misperceptions from that original characterization. Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think one thing that, you know, and this is kind of the basis of my question when the mayor was presenting is um, how are we looped into the mayor's? implementation team's process, uh, because it's my understanding that uh, one of the benefits of having a staff direction that's approved by this body is it puts it into the public record about what this workflow is going to look like, what recommendations are going to come back, and um, what type of analysis is going to be provided. And so I just don't have a lot of clarity around, you know, this is kind of that bigger government structure question of, um, when the executive branch is pursuing a, a policy, at what point do we get to get report backs of analysis or be able to provide feedback on those particular um, work streams? And so there's there's not a lot of clarity for me, for me on that, and I think that's why I feel it's pretty appropriate for us to initiate um, some sort of formal action so that we can make sure that that work happens in public and, and through the legislative process. Thank you, Council Member Payne. Are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? 
I'm not seeing any. Um, I would like to respond to what Council Member Payne mentioned, though, and that's that the whole point of the Council President and I developing this subcommittee of Committee of the Whole was that there was one place that we would do our work together. I, I happen to agree with um, Mr. Carl that this work should be combined and we should start talking about this as one plan instead of the mayor's plan and the legislative side's plan. Um, but I think that's the whole part of having all these conversations in public about it, even when they are long and fairly wonky and sometimes tedious. Um, it is really important work. It's perhaps the most um, structural change that our city has undergone in many decades. Um, and I am committed to that. Um, so Council Member Wansley Warlaba's motion is in front of us. And without any further discussion, I will ask for a voice vote first. Um, is there uh, all those in favor of Council Member Wansley Warlaba's motion? Please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. It sounds like the nays have it and that motion is defeated. Next. Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Payne. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in anticipation of this vote, I prepared a alternative motion that perhaps might be able to um, address some of the concerns of the body. Um, and I just want to read it really quick. Uh, so this motion is to direct staff to evaluate comparable cities that have a unified community slash public safety department to identify and analyze criteria and associated metrics which would support the successful integration of the city's public safety functions into a unified office and to present the findings and recommendations from that analysis to the Committee of the Whole's Government Structure Subcommittee by the end of June 2022. Further, directing staff to schedule and provide notice of a public comment period for the subcommittee to accept public feedback on those findings and recommendations. Um, I'm introducing this motion because I think it really actually speaks to some of the issues raised today around how we're trying to move towards that more integrated function of the legislative and executive branch sharing power and allowing us to be a good council to do our work. Um, through a democratic process. And I think by doing that through our committee of the whole subcommittee on government structure, it's helping us actually move this work forward and do it in collaboration with the executive branch. Thank you. So council member Payne has put forward a motion. Is that motion seconded? It is seconded. Is there any discussion on this motion? I have a question on this motion, and I'm not sure who would be best to ask, but Mr. Carl is in the audience, so I might ask him. <laughs> uh, I don't understand what the difference would be between a public comment period on this kind of findings at the end of June versus having a public hearing on any ordinance that we would possibly put together, which would be required. Um, can you help for me to discern what would be the value of what on its face looks absolutely like what we are already doing and perhaps duplicative but have a public comment period. Or I invite the author to answer. I mean, I'm not trying to take that away from you, Council Member Payne. Oh no, um, I think the public comment period on this specific issue is important just because of the nature and urgency of our public safety work that we need to do as a city. Thank you. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Mr. Carl? The only thing I would, Madam Chair, thank, thank you for inviting me to address it. To the extent, yes, the legislative process has within it um, built in a public hearing on any ordinance. And with this government restructure, I've said this before, I, I may not have been clear. It probably needs to be said each time. We will have multiple ordinances coming forward. There is not one ordinance that we will be working on. Multiple, which means multiple public hearings. Each of those ordinances will have a public hearing. So I would anticipate we will have a lot of opportunity for public engagement. Um, on this specific motion, I I'm reading intent into this, uh, looking at this at this now, so I, I could be wrong and I would defer to the author. But given the, the um, 
current state of the community uh, and the subject matter uh, that is the subject of this, public safety, community safety, a unified department. One potential advantage of, of the proposal to have a public comment period separate from a public hearing is that often a public hearing is done right before a vote. And so on this particular matter, a public comment period would allow the council to have public comment uh, react to that, conduct its official public hearing, and then take action on an ordinance related to this. So um, much like we often do more than one public hearing on the budget, this would be just an additional opportunity. So it's up to the body, of course, to, to make that decision, but that would be um, one interpretation, I think, that could be made. Council President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. and. This could be either for uh, Council Member <clears throat> Payne and or Clerk Carl. Do we know that there are comparable cities that have combined community public safety departments? Uh, Madam Chair, yes, uh, Council President. Uh, there are other cities that do have a unified public safety department. Um, one that comes to mind is Ithaca, I believe. Um, in fact, one of the consultants in the, uh, who is leading the search for our new chief came from a jurisdiction that had a unified public safety department. It was in a suburb of Atlanta, so there, there are a few out there. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, um, all those in favor of this motion, and then just FYI to my colleagues, we're gonna have to go back to the original one that was actually printed on the agenda today. Um, all those in favor of this new motion by Council Member Payne, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. I believe that motion fails, um, unless you would request a voice vote. Yeah, let's do a roll call. I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Wansley Worlaba. Aye. Council Member Rainville. No. Council Member Vita. No. Council Member Ellison is absent. Council Member Osman. Uh, no. I, I'm so sorry. I uh, no. No. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Council Member Goodman. No. President Jenkins. Nay. Council Member Koski. No. Vice Chair Chavez. Aye. Chair Palmasano. No. That's three ayes and seven nays. Thank you. That motion does fail. I would like to go back to what was on the printed agenda today. Um, I'd like to put forward a motion to remove that staff directive from the COW agenda. So it would be a denial of that staff direction. Um, and is that an appropriate motion, clerk? I'm seeing a nod, yes. Um, so I'd like to make that motion so that we can come to full conclusion with this, um, with this government structure um, other direction. I think we all need to move together uh, as a whole and I think there's a lot of opportunities we will have to continue to loop back and check in as we move forward. But the um, printed agenda staff directive. Um, Just a clarification. Clerk Carl yeah, was I'm, shaking his head when I'm, he yeah. said that was appropriate or not. So, If we could just hang on one second as the parliamentary procedure. Point, point of personal privilege. Go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, there is a di staff direction on the agenda that is fully in front of us. Are you moving it? If you are, then let's, wh what is the problem? The staff directive that is in front of us is item number four, the original um, here on the printed agenda, and Mr. Carl is here to. Which was substituted by the author, and the substitute motion failed. So there is no go back to the original. It was substituted. The substitute motion failed. There's no action on any of that. So we do not need to go back to it. I don't believe you do. Uh, there's I a see. system process where we need to close out on the agenda. But to me, that's ministerial. The, the body has acted. 
there's nothing to forward when it failed. Um, so I, I'm sorry for that confusion. Okay, I apologize for that confusion as well. Um, it looks like we have now concluded all of these motions before us. Does anybody have another motion or want to weigh in differently on that? Um, thank you. Next, we will receive reports from the standing committees on the matters to be considered by the full council this Thursday. Uh, the first is the BIS Committee, Business Inspections, Housing, and Zoning, and I anticipate Councilmember Osman will read that agenda. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Vice President. We have 14 items uh, that we'll like to move forward uh, on the council meeting on Thursday, and um, uh, one is Four Seasons Hotel Minneapolis, um, approving application for Four Seasons Hotel Minneapolis. Uh, item two, approving application for Grand Sunrise. Item three, Cycle Village Academy Revenue Bond. Item four, uh, Lake, I'm sorry, Lake and Nicollet Pre-Development Plan. Item five, liquor license approval. Item six is a liquor, liquor license renewal. Item seven is gambling license approval. Item eight is application for environmental grant funding in the spring of 2022 Brownfield Grand Ground. Item nine is waiving the city register apprenticeship policy for the commercial property development fund loan um, located at 1201 Lake Street. Item 10 is uh, exclusive development rights to Northgate development located in 1026 Bournemouth Avenue. Item 11 is a step up alumni outreach accepting grant from Minneapolis Foundation. Item 12 is Minneapolis downtown taxing area boundary change. Uh, requesting uh, the state of Minnesota to authorize expansion downtown for taxing district boundaries. Item 13 is rezoning and air rights vacation on um, 1300 West Broadway. And last, item 14 is rezoning Jonathan Raja. Rajaratam, I'm sorry, for 2718 Grand Avenue. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Thank you. Next, we have the Policy and Government Oversight Committee, and that committee's um, report will be read by Councilmember Wansley Warlaba. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have 17 items uh, to consider for our POGO agenda. Um, the first will be the passage of a resolution accepting a gift from the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce for the Office of Mayor Jacob Fry for Executive Support Services. Um, the second item is approval of two transgender equity council appointments. The third, approval of a capital long range improvements committee, um, as well as appointments. Um, uh, number four is accepting low bid for the Minnehaha Neighborhood ADA Pedestrian Ramp Improvements Project. The fifth is accepting a low bid for the Bryant Avenue Reconstruction Project. Number six is accepting a low bid for the 50th uh, Street West and Broadway Street Northeast uh, Signal Construction. Number seven is accepting a low bid for Catch Basin and Manhole Repairs. Uh, number eight, has a couple, 13 under it, but um, these are all to, towards authorizing contracts with community partners that support community well-being. Uh, number nine is authorizing contract amendments with Bolton and Mink Inc. for engineering and design services for Bryan Avenue South Reconstruction Project. Number 10 is authorizing a contract amendment with Keystone Compensation Group, LLC, for a job classification uh, consultant services. Number 11 is authorizing a contract amendment with Tyler Technologies, Inc. for a computer-assisted mass appraisal system. Uh, number 12 is authorizing a contract amendment with uh, Vite and Company, Inc. for the 4th Street North and South and 2nd Avenue North to 4th Avenue South Street Reconstruction Project. 
Number 13 um, through 17 is related to a number of legal settlements. Um, number 13 is one approving a uh, settlement for uh, Knutson Construction Company versus the city of Minneapolis. Number 14 is a legal settlement for Maria. Uh, I am not gonna botch that last name. I know how that feels. Mots get botched all the time. So we're gonna say Maria versus the city of Minneapolis. Number 15 is Bridget Galvin versus the city of Minneapolis. Number 16 is a legal settlement for Erica uh, versus the city of Minneapolis. And number 17 is a workers' compensation claim for uh, Aaron Morrison. And that concludes our items. Thank you, Council Member Wansley Warlaba. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Next, we have the Public Health and Safety Committee, chaired by Council Member Vita. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, the Public Health and Safety Committee will be bringing forward three items for consideration at this week's council meeting. Item one is granting consent to the mayor's nomination of Alberta Gillespie to the appointed position of Director of Civil Rights. Item two is authorizing a hosting agreement with Indigenous Peoples Task Force for internship experience. And item three is authorizing a contract with the John Gore Theatrical Group Incorporated for the police department to provide bomb detection services at the Orpheum State and Pantages Theaters. I'll stand for questions on these items. Thank you. I'm not seeing any. We'll move along to the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee that was chaired this cycle by Councilmember Koski. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee will be bringing forward eight items for consideration this week uh, at our council meeting. Number one is approving the street lighting project at 1919 Nicollet Avenue South. Number two, approving a resolution making additions to the municipal state aid system. Number three, increasing funding for the 2022 street resurfacing program from the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriation Act. Number four, authorizing a cooperative agreement with MnDOT for Trunk Highway 55 project from 32nd Street East to Trunk Highway 62. Number five, approving the Edina Art Fair large block event permit for June 3rd through the 5th of 2022. Number six is approving the annual Saloon Pride large block event permit for June 24th through the 26th of 2022. Number seven, establishing park restrictions on Dowling Avenue North for the per the approval approved layout of the Upper Harbor Terminal public site. And number eight, approving City of Minneapolis comments on the E-Line Bus Rapid Transit BRT recommended corridor plan. I'll stand for questions on these items. Thank you. Next, we have the Audit Committee, and I'll go ahead and quickly read, read that report. We received and filed and published the Communications Spend Audit Report that was about how um, communications are handled around the city enterprise. We also received and filed an update report of the Internal Audit Department's work in progress, including some efforts on government structure, though the bulk of that presentation was today. The piece for this Thursday's council meeting is one component for, which is for the regular biennial body-worn camera report for park police to refer a direction to the city clerk to transmit the audit report to the appropriate agency within the state of Minnesota. This is about their compliance with state law. Happy to answer any questions for that. Before we conclude, colleagues, and thank you for hanging in there with me, we have just a couple of announcements about other things happening for Thursday's council meeting or before, briefly, um, first from Council Member Koski and then Council Member Chavez. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President. As Budget Committee Chair, I wanted to take a moment to note that Mayor Fry presented his State of the City Address today which includes recommendations to appropriate funds coming from the federal government related to the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, we will have formal actions at our council meetings on Thursday to receive his address and to refer consideration of ARPA funds to our budget committee. And I've already sent an email to my colleagues outlining the process for our consideration of the mayor's proposals and all our budget committee meetings have been scheduled on our internal calendars as well as notice to the public on the limbs uh, or our legislative information management system. So for right now, I'll mention just a few dates. Our first meetings of the budget committee will be May 4th and May 6th, both at 10 a.m., where we will hear presentations from our budget office on the American Rescue Plan and the mayor's current proposals. And the following week on May 12th, the budget committee will host a public hearing at 6.05 p.m. to hear comments from the public on the mayor's proposals. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and I'm happy to stand for any questions. Thank you. Also, Councilmember Chavez, you have a um, notice for an honorary resolution. Yes, so we're gonna, I'm bringing forth a Cinco de Mayo resolution, it's the 5th of May uh, resolution this Thursday at full council. So we'll be sending uh, an update of that language, hopefully by tomorrow. We have a draft that the city clerk will be posting, I believe. Uh, I don't know if there's gonna be changes yet, but there may be. <laughs> and then in honor of that, we're gonna be turning the 35, I-35W bridge, uh, red, green, and white on the 5th of May, which is Cinco de Mayo. It's a celebration of the Battle of Puebla when uh, the city of Puebla, where my family is from, was able to be victorious when um, people were trying to take over our land. So it's a big day. Thank you. With that, we've concluded all business to come before the committee today. So seeing no objection, I will thank you all and declare this meeting adjourned. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>